I'd like to call the order. September 10th, 2024, meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. If folks in the room could please quiet down, we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? And Cummings? Here. I'd like to ask any of the board members if someone would like to de dedicate today's moment of silence. Seeing none, we will just take a general moment of silence. Y'all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, the physical liberty of oh. Before we begin, I'd like to do a brief land acknowledgement. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Waswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Next time on our agenda, I'd like to ask the CAO if there's been any additions or deletions to consent or the regular agenda. Uh, yes, uh, there is one change to the regular agenda, item number 10. There's additional materials. Revised memo, packet page 53 is replaced, and revised attachment E, packet page 69 is also replaced. Option one, table content and total cost row revised to say, this option is more aligned with the funding distribution from the prior RFP, and it spreads the money around to more programs in tiers two and three, maximizing funding distribution as described in the funding distribution guidelines. That concludes the uh, corrections to the agenda. Thank you. I would like to ask if there's any member of the board who would like to remove an item from consent and place on our regular agenda. Seeing none, um, we will open up um, our meeting to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us to items that are not on our agenda. Or if you'd like to speak to an item on consent, now is the time. And if you'd like to speak to an item on our regular agenda, just note that when that item is heard, you will not be able to speak to that item a second time. And with that, I'll open up to our first speaker. Uh, you'll have two minutes. Yeah, good morning, board and executive staff. My name is James Ewing Whitman. What is it? September 10th? Can, can I pause? Does the, the it not work? Can, can I pause you for a sec? Yeah. I'm going to ask for those people who are coming in, if you can please um, be silent as you're coming in the door so we can hear our, our speakers. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Justin, thank you. Um, yeah, it's September 10th, 2024. Tomorrow, September 11th, 2021 was, excuse me, 20, 2001 was quite an interesting day in U.S. history. You know, I didn't stand to the Pledge of Allegiance to the corporate pirate flag. The United States was a constitutional republic only till 1783. Folks might want to do some research on what they're pledging allegiance to. So I'm not quite sure what to say. I've been showing up here for over four years in the city council for over five. I think that everybody can change. You know, I found myself taking up an interesting prospect of becoming a full-time student. And so I'm, I've embarked in that. I'm taking three criminal justice classes right now. It's quite fascinating. Now, the electronic engagement is kind of interesting. Now, this book, seventh edition, Human Relations and Law Enforcement, in the first seven pages, kind of describes to me how I personally could be at least 125 times more effective at what I've already been doing. Um, so, you know, what's going on? School has started for a lot of people. I read something this morning where seven young men have just dropped dead on the football field. Gee, why is that happening? Folks might want to look up a man-made concoction called graphene hydride. Imagine them. You know, um, a razor blade and, some, and reduce it down by 100,000. That's what's flowing through all of our bodies due to the technologies that are in the food, the water, the injections, and the air, and all enhanced by frequencies. You know, something else I was reading is 
The CDC seems to think at this point in 2024, autism is one in 28. But there's other information that's saying in the United States, autism is one in eight. So we have some serious issues going on in our society. And I'm here to hopefully see some changes. Thank you. Good morning, my name's Andrea Turnbull. I'm um, an, the Acute Services Manager at Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health, and I'm here to read the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors Proclamation for Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Whereas September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, a crucial period dedicated to heightening awareness of suicide prevention resources and encouraging those in crisis to seek help. And whereas suicide remains a critical public health issue profoundly affecting individuals, families, and communities across the United States, with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reporting that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, tragically claiming over 47,000 lives annually and claiming 41 lives in Santa Cruz County last year. And whereas the state of California has made available a telephone resource 24 hours a day, seven days a week for suicide prevention and mental health crisis where individuals can call 988 to speak to a trained person and obtain confidential support. And whereas the County of Santa Cruz stands firmly committed to increasing awareness about suicide prevention and fostering mental health and wellness for all residents. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, chair of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, do hereby complain, proclaim September 2024 as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County and urge all residents to join in this observance by educating themselves about the warning signs of suicide, reaching out compassionately to those in need, and supporting the efforts of Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health Services, Suicide Prevention Services of the Central Coast, and other local organizations dedicated pre to preventing suicide and promote promoting mental health. Thank you to the Board of Supervisors. And I do want to say that our suicide prevention strategic plan is available uh, for public comment. Um, we are welcome that until September the 19th, and it's available on the Behavioral Health website of Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Amanda Goings, and I am an emergency services analyst with the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. Chair Cummings, members of the board, in honor of National Preparedness Month, I wanted to speak briefly on agenda item number 35. OR3 has been working very hard over the last year to advance countywide emergency management preparedness and response initiatives. Since December of last year, OR3 has activated the Emergency Operations Center five times in order to prepare for, respond to, and recover from a variety of extreme weather-related events. But our work doesn't stop with EOC activations. It also includes collaboration with our community partners to engage in a whole community operational planning that is inclusive of our most vulnerable communities so that we are better prepared for to respond to emergencies more equitably. OR3 has prioritized engaging with the broad range of stakeholders that is inclusive of the whole community and the planning process to rewrite the County of Santa Cruz Emergency Operations Plan, which is before your board for acceptance today, and to create emergency support function annexes in both emergency management and mass care and shelter. Over the summer months, OR3 and Cal OES, in combination with several other agencies, partnered with the Community Action Board to attend monthly in-person migrant farm worker resource fairs and national night out at Pinot Lake County Park. The resource fairs move to a different South County farm location each month and OR3 has had the opportunity to outreach to approximately 800 farm workers and provide them with Spanish preparedness printed materials so that they are better prepared and more aware of local resources before the next emergency. OR3 would be happy to continue our public outreach and education efforts and attend any up, upcoming community meetings you may hold within your districts to increase disaster preparedness and demo resource awareness tools like Cruise Aware and our Safer SC web application to better prepare a community. Thank you for your time today, consideration of item 35 and your continued support of OR3 in our community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board chair. Uh, Michael Beaton, I'm the Director of General Services for the County of Santa Cruz and the Cal Fire County Fire Contract Administrator. 
1945, the County of Santa Cruz entered, entered into a cooperative agreement with the state California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, now known locally as CAL FIRE. In that time, the County Fire Department was born. Through that initial agreement with CAL FIRE, the unit chief over our County Fire Department has always been the unit chief for CAL FIRE that represents Santa Cruz County. Chief Armstrong, who has served as your local county fire chief for the last three years, was recently promoted to CAL FIRE headquarters in Sacramento, leaving a vacancy for our county fire chief. Through a recruitment performed by CAL FIRE in partnership with San Mateo County and Santa Cruz County, the state has appointed Jed Wilson as your new unit chief of CAL FIRE San Mateo, San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. And by way of our cooperative agreement, your new local county fire chief of Santa Cruz County. With that, I would like to introduce you to Chief Wilson, a local resident of Capitola, uh, as your new county fire chief. Uh, thank you, Director Beaton, uh, Chair Cummings, and members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity to serve as your fire chief. Um, Santa Cruz County has been part of my life for uh, the last 25 years, and I'm looking forward to many more years in Santa Cruz County. Um, I'm pretty excited for this new opportunity and to move uh, county fire fire forward. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting those of you that I do not know yet and uh, working collaboratively to better serve the citizens and visitors of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations on the new position. Hello, my name is Miranda Shermer and I'm a senior social worker in the county's Family and Children's Services Division, also known as Child Protective Services and I'm a proud member of SEIU 521. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, a social worker from our department will show up for any child experiencing abuse or neglect anywhere in this county. We come to local hospitals when a baby is born with symptoms of prenatal drug exposure, or when a child comes to school with unusual bruises, or when law enforcement calls about a parent in a mental health crisis. We use our extensive education and skills to make complex decisions about child safety and removal. And we work side by side with parents and children over time to help them get the help they need to heal and recover. It is a job with high stakes and high stress. To be able to do this challenging work and to have a robust workforce, we need to be compensated fairly. The county's own compensation study showed that wages for social workers in Santa Cruz County are 8.4% less than market rate. That's a comparison to the average wage in nine other counties. Here in Santa Cruz County, wages are at the bottom. Is child safety less important to county leaders here than in other counties? I hope not. Uncompetitive wages means high turnover and compromises to child safety. If management and personnel in other counties can figure out how to pay their social workers and all of their county staff fairly, then in Santa Cruz County, they should be able to manage the same. We are raising our voices because the most vulnerable children in this community deserve to be served by a workforce that is fully staffed and stable, and that cannot come without fair pay. Please support our reasonable request that we be paid a fair wage. Fair pay is a win for workers, for the county, and for the community we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just remind folks, cool. totally appreciate the, the spirit hands. We want to keep the cheering down because we don't want people cheering and booing for different things just because we have differences of opinion. So very much appreciate it. Hello, thank you very much for hearing me again today. My name is Tim Delaney and I live on, on the top of near Summit. Uh, I am highly supportive of these folks here. I was I was one of those children. And what I can say is that uh, these situations that I endured when I was young, they do not go away. You carry them throughout your entire life, okay? So I have a few comments here. Um, it's interesting, I do, I'm just gonna rattle them off. I, I just got up and got out here. Uh, Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, <laughs> wow, she's awesome. Beach, blonde, bad, built, butch body. That is incredible. I would hire her, no problem, right on the spot, okay? This guy, Jay Weber, <laughs> blubbering bitch boy. What is up with that junk? You know, this is the United States of America that I live in. This is appalling. No child 
is responsible for the actions of adults, past, present, or future. Okay, I feel like here, I'm an adult here dealing with my mother's guardianship, and it is horrendous. And I feel like it's all coming right back down on me here. And this is for the state of Nevada. Uh, it's not a good situation that I'm in. And I may have to also self-report because I worked with a clearance at one point. Okay. Uh, guardianship is placing myself on a sword to save my mother. We do not junk on women, children, combat veterans, disabled people in American society. All right. So I'm supportive of Dick Cheney and stop junking on American scientists. Okay. So those are my comments today. And I wish all of you fine folks very well. Thank you so much for coming out here. I feel like you're wonderful people. Thank you, sir. And you would support my mother. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm a mental health worker in the county health clinics. Here is a community member concerned about the ongoing labor negotiations between the county and our labor union, SEIU 521. County mental health resources have been limited for some time now. There are some 30, that's three zero, open positions in the mental health client specialist category alone. I can speak from experience in saying that this is not because there is a shortage of mental health workers. There are people out there who want to do this work and who are trained to do it. The reason they aren't here is that these jobs simply don't pay enough for them, for us, to survive and thrive while doing this work. When we ask why other positions, notably management, are able to get massive increases in pay, we are told that it's necessary to hire and retain competitive staff. When we ask about why we are not able to receive similar pay increases, we're told there simply isn't money to do so. What is really happening here is that our positions are not valued enough to provide the funds necessary to fill them. The county and the community have decided that we are okay with local mental health resources being understaffed. We have all, some of us through our actions, most of us through our inaction, decided that this is an acceptable state of affairs. The way that we spend our public funds is, or at least should be, a reflection of our community values, those things in which we believe and hold dear. I believe that my colleagues and I deserve to be paid a living wage. I believe that the county health clinics and their employees provide a valuable service to the community. I believe, first and foremost, that the low-income and elderly residents of Santa Cruz County deserve just as much as anyone else to receive excellent medical and mental health care. I invite the board and all present to reflect on your own beliefs on these matters and on what you consider to be acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Olivia Martinez. I'm the Region 2 Director. 544 City of Santa Cruz. 544 Metro. 444 Monterey County. These are the contracts that I've settled, and that is the amount that those folks are going to be making. The county likes facts. Let's give you the facts. Santa Cruz, your offer, 7% three years. San Mateo ended with 10%. Napa, 11%. Monterey, 12%. Marin, 12%. Solano, 12%. Santa Clara, 13%. Sonoma, 13.5%. Contra Costa, 15%. For the first time in history, you guys are way behind all these comparable counties. There is something to say with this third Board of Supervisors meetings where people have come. These are your employees, your employees that are coming to you, telling you they are not happy. They are not happy with their wages. They are not happy with their working conditions and how they are being treated. There is a disconnection between what is happening with the higher ups and your employees. And that cannot continue. We have offered solutions. Your bargaining team is saying to you, we have too many proposals. Guess why? They refuse to work with us doing the life of the contract to address these issues. This is why we have so many articles at the table because it's the only time we can address these issues. While Monterey County is an excellent labor partner, while City of Santa Cruz is excellent labor partner, even though we disagree, your personal office, your personnel department does not want to work with your employees or with this union. 
It is time for a change. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kirsten Jewell, and I am a proud county employee. I have worked for Santa Cruz County um, since for 10 years, and I'm currently a senior mental health client specialist. Um, I work in a department, I work in a department who has 30 open vacancies or within HSA has 30 open vacancies. Um, we have watched, I have watched several of our the managers in HSA get $20,000 promotions to move into senior management while we are being told that there's no money to give us an equitable wage. Um, we have been working through the pandemic, working, uh, with so many openings. We're doing the, the jobs of more than one person. This is a direct, this is putting our like vulnerable members of our community in danger. We are not able to serve the community members in the way that they deserve to be served. I personally was like, my life was saved by the, um, the services that are provided in this in Santa Cruz County. And I am determined to remain a Santa Cruz County employee to give back to the community that has given me the life that I have. Um, yesterday or not yesterday, but recently I just, um, I just discharged a client who had his first suicide attempt at 13 years old. He uh, continued to attempt suicide multiple times throughout his life. He's 26 years old. I worked with him for two years over the pandemic. He's now off all medication, hasn't had any suicidal ideation for the last year. And that is a direct result of the, the services that we have been able, able to offer. We need to be able to offer the people the services that they need and require. And we cannot do that with a staff shortage crisis of, of, of under or around 30 to 40% vacancy. We need to be paid a living wage. What you're offering right now doesn't even cover the amount that, that increase in our benefits premium we will not be getting we won't be seeing any increase in our wage with the tiny uh cola increase that you are currently offering please do as what these other people are asking listen to your values and please show us that you that we matter to you thank you and please if you all can hold your applause thank you um, good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, I didn't plan on speaking here today, but I think you wanted it, or I think it'd be good for you guys to know why I'm strike ready. Um, management and the county personnel has not really valued us as workers. Um, one example that I can give you is the a Crisis Innovation Now project uh, is rolling out to seven days a week. It's affecting uh, the MERT um, team. Uh, management acknowledged that they will be stretching the Mert staff quite a bit, but they're still going to do it. So recently, in the last two weeks, Mert staff rolled out to cover uh, to cover seven days a week. And the first Saturday of this rollout, there was no uh, in-person supervisor on campus to cover for Saturday, and there has been no in-person security uh, for staff who have to report to these buildings on weekends. And additionally. Um, the, the MERT phone lines for the public to con contact, <clears throat> excuse me, to contact if somebody has a mental health crisis was not even set up. They do not care about us. They do not care about our safety and they don't care about burning us out. And that's why I'm strike ready. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Carroll and I work at Animal Services for two and a half years. Um, I am a SEIU 521 union member, and I've seen all of your faces several times now. I've been to many board meetings in the last year because our I, our animal shelter is in crisis. Um, we, our low wages are even lower than the county. We only have five steps. Everybody else has seven. That is something that is in our contract that is not being discussed with personnel. Um, in our county, we have very dedicated animal services workers who show up every single day, despite the fact we are not paid enough to live in this county. Um, we are facing a low, the low wages also mean that we are understaffed. We had to close our Watsonville shelter on a Saturday and probably will have to in the future because of our staffing levels. We had a person who worked for a month and then left because their former employer could pay them more. We have high turnover. We have low, low, dem um, low spirit, I guess. Um, we're all burnt out. Uh, 
I've said this before, and I will keep coming back um, because we need a fair contract. We need to pay us what we're worth. We need, um, and that's not just for the people in this room, but for the future. We want a county that we promise all these good things and people are really proud of this county and their people consistently come to the animal shelter and they are excited to adopt new animals. They're so happy that we save their animals lives and we can't do that without you pushing personnel to give us a fair contract. We will, we are faced with an animal overpopulation crisis. I support all the other workers. We work closely with behavioral health. We work closely with the sheriff's office and we all need a fair wage and we all need support. So thank you so much. Please give us a fair contract. Hello, my name is Penny Ellis and I'm so happy to be here today finally. Can you please uh, pull the mic down to your See, okay. There we go. Uh, yeah, I've been working on Bill AB 626, which is the Home Food Cooking Act, um, for about the past five years. And today they're going to be voting on it. So I'm really pleased about that. Uh, I live at the Boulder Creek Golf Course and I'm semi retired. I organize a lot of food and farm events and workshops for food preservation. Uh, I love cooking for groups of people and I'm so excited about opening my supper club where I live. Um, if the bill passes today, um, the, uh, I also plan to do some neighborhood cooking classes where people can take and, and, uh, prepare meals and take them home with them as well. The beauty of Miko's, the micro enterprise home kitchen operations you're going to be voting on today is they have the ability to address certain communities of people for special diets like veg vegan, gluten free, and, and address specific health problems like diabetes and obesity. Um, I'm very impressed with how our community has come together and kicked into gear for this. The El Pajaro uh, Community Development Corporation in Watsonville is, is already offering courses uh, for a MECO training program in both English and Spanish. And the Cook Alliance out of Oakland uh, that spearheaded this bill has uh, opened up a Cook Academy for Migos. It's an eight-week training program where when people graduate from it, they or get a scholarship of $3,000 to open their own business. So things are already in place for this, which is really great. And I look forward to cooking for my community and for my neighborhood and uh, hope that you will vote the bill today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members of the board, good morning. My name is Todd Goodberg. I've been a heavy equipment mechanic too in public works for nine years, and I'm a member of SEIU 521. I'm here to talk to you about why ample rest for our on-call and emergency response workers and an increase in on-call pay will help with the retention of our specialized workforce. As you know, winters in Santa Cruz County have been especially destructive to our transportation, drainage, and underground infrastructure. These storms have crews working late, sometimes into the wee hours of the morning, in dangerous conditions without proper break or meal periods, and without ample rest once they are relieved, as they are required to return to work the next day at 7 a.m. This cycle can go on for days and sometimes weeks, causing exhaustion among staff and can and has resulted in dangerous accidents. Not only is our staff affected during the winter months, but in recent years, the repair projects from winter storms extend into the summer and fall months, requiring crews to come in on their days off and weekends for months at a time. This has a negative effect on the personal and family lives of my coworkers. These hardworking folks deserve to be rewarded for their tireless efforts to keep the community moving. And the way to do that is by giving our workforce the rest required to do their jobs safely and efficiently and a fair contract to keep our skilled laborers working here at the County of San Cruz well into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Meg Sandow. I'm a retired psychologist from Children's Behavioral Health. I saved the county and district school districts hundreds of thousands of dollars during the time I was employed through my work on inappropriate AB 3632 claims for residential placement. When I retired at age 68 due to the longevity schedule, I started out at 25% less than what my years of service would previously have qualified me to receive. There has been no increase in the past 12 years 
The county has refused to address that during contract negotiations. Uh, and so much for respecting years of service. Beyond the poor treatment of county retirees, this county has been negotiating in bad faith. Delaying in the provision of necessary information, showing up to negotiations unprepared and making offensive and unresponsive offers. As did I, my colleagues work their asses off to serve this community. They do so within the context of a 40% vacancy rate. That's according to the grand jury report. Four out of 10, almost half of all positions needed to adequately serve this community are empty. What would that look like in our schools, our hospitals, your doctor's clinic, your trash collection, the provision of water and utilities, the availability of your internet? This is a disaster in the making. And remarkably, it appears that the county does not care. I want the people of this county to hear the leadership does not care. I used to recommend the county is a good place to work, and I no longer do. The work to serve the community is still meaningful. The people are still great. But the disrespect and disregard for the workers and for the community itself is insufferable. 80% by HUD standards are earning at low income levels and are being priced out of serving this community. If you remember my August story about the house, the county's workers and this community are your house. You are tearing your house down to feed a fire that you have created. Open your eyes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Monica Tomlinson. I worked for the county for six years, and formerly I worked for the city of Santa Cruz for 28 years. Um, I've always been struck by Santa Cruz as Santa Cruz has a heart. It it has a heart like bigger than other cities. I, I'm I'm originally from the Midwest, and I just feel like y'all need to have a heart. You have a need to have a heart for these people. Where's your heart? I mean, just what she had said before. It's true. The house is, how can you, you know, we are the foundation. We're kind of like the foundation of the house, right? And it, it's not, it's going to fall down if you don't, y'all don't do something. You, you, these people really need, we need raises. Um, look at the, look at inflation, look at the cost of living. And I understand you guys, it, I understand it's been challenging. I know all the money that was spent because of, in my opinion, the climate crisis, but you need to get creative now. We don't want the house to burn down. We want Santa Cruz to continue to have a heart and we are your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos dias. Cada uno. Me llamo Jesús Macías, representando el programa Nuestro Color Morado, apoyando a 521. No queremos sentirnos solamente apoyados, sino apoyados de parte de cada uno de ustedes, por favor. Ojalá que nuestra voz, nuestro voto, lo tomen en cuenta cada uno de ustedes en esta mañana y se lo vamos a agradecer con todo corazón. Gracias. Gracias. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Providence, and I'm a proud member of the union, SEIU 2015, and I'm here to support my siblings so that they know that we're here with them on their struggle. We're, we're supporting you and to be there for, for us when we also need the support. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Buenos dias, good morning, members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Danielle Dodge Sr. I am with uh, the president of the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council, the Union of Unions, representing over 80 unions, including everybody here, and over 35,000 members in the Monterey Bay area. I'm here to be able to support and just to, to let you know that all the unions across the county, in Santa Cruz and Monterey County, we stand in solidarity with all my relations, all my brothers and sisters here, the essential workers, the county workers, my brothers and sisters, my siblings in 2015. We're standing here together today to tell you 
that the working class, the middle class, what's left of it in Monterey and Santa Cruz County is struggling. We're not asking for handouts. We're asking for fair wages. We're asking for a cost of living that's, that helps us to be able to feed our families, to be able to support um, all our, our relatives in the community. These are people that live here, right? These are people that grew up here. These are people that live here. This is the community. We want to be able to let you know that when the, when the pandemic comes, or disaster comes, who's on the front line, right? Who's on the front line? The essential workers. And by the way, who's watching your mom today, right? You know, who's watching your parents, right? I want to be able to advocate for them too. Their wages are some of the lowest in the county. That's not right. That's not fair. That's not a commitment to working families, and that's not a commitment to our seniors. So listen to their voices, hear what they have to say, support them, but not just with words, but with actions. Because when we fight, we win. When we fight, when we fight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Mary Ellen Olson. I've been a child welfare worker. This will be my 10th year here. Um, sadly, almost every single person that I started this job with has left the county. The majority of my coworkers have left for cost of living increases, for being priced out of this county, for the high um, wages that other counties offer us. We were on the front lines of the pandemic. We did not stop seeing our clients. We did not stop doing investigations. We literally hold the life and death sometimes of the children in our communities. And we deserve the cost of living increase. I'm a citizen of Watsonville. I was already priced out of Santa Cruz. I'm being priced out of Watsonville. I'm a single mom to a 10 year old and I can't afford the things that he needs. And I know I'm not alone. I know my coworkers are in the same position. I have coworkers who lit, who work second jobs because the, the price of the wages that we are being offered as a county in different positions are not making ends meet. The cost of living increase will change the lives of not only everyone here, but the many, many members that our union represents. We need fair wages. We need the cost of living increase. We need our demands to be respected. We deserve better. And I think that in the end, seeing the fair increases that our union is proposing will lead to better outcomes in every department. Thank you. All right, before you speak, I just want to ask if there's any other member of the public here present today who would like to speak. If so, please um, get in line. Otherwise, we're going to move to our online um, attendees. Go ahead. So, sir, you'll be our last speaker in person. Good morning. I am here. I work for the community. I serve the community just as you all serve the community. I get up every morning and am held accountable for the work that I do, just like everybody else here. So what we're asking right now is for you all to hold personnel accountable to the process of negotiation. We do not want to strike. We are strike ready, but nobody here wants to miss a day of work. I certainly do not want to strike. I enjoy my job. I love my job. I love serving the community just as I'm sure you all enjoy serving the community, which is why you're in the role you're in. We're all here because that's what we believe in. So please hold personnel accountable to, to good negotiation of good faith and have it comparable to what other counties are giving. The woman with the, the uh, numbers up of all the other various counties that are our neighbors, that's where we're losing our employees to. I cannot count how many people have gone over to Santa Clara County because they get so much better pay, so much more respect and have safer working conditions and they have a management that listens to them. So please, there is time. We do not need to strike. We do not want to strike. There is time to make personnel be held accountable for the job that they're supposed to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, gentlemen. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I've been employed with Santa Cruz County since like 2019, but kind of shame that I keep coming back as a temp, as an extra help employee. You know, the wages they suck. Um, other counties do get paid way better than us. And I thought, you know, Santa Cruz County is awesome. I love this county. I've always showed support to my county, and I like to pay it back to my community as well. Um, we do deserve better wages, you know, just like the guy said earlier. Who's taking care of my mom? No one. She's out there by herself in an apartment. Been living there for like 19 years. Uh, sometimes I don't even have enough money to get gas. Everything's just so expensive, but come on, Santa Cruz County. I know you guys are better than this. Help us out, man. Good morning. Not the first time with the mic. Um, missed you at the last meeting of the county's uh, committee. I've got that three minutes there. Please check it out. Okay. Um, I want to say hi to all of the unions, okay? Because we're going to have a different union. I'm speaking to a board turnkey at the small uh, old, uh, what do you call, Red Lobster building where my church, Victory Outreach, if you don't know, he just left the Harlow School District to bring people to what he believes in. He can reach those that are people who have come out of prison. I'm a black sheep, and I'm proud that I'm here today with a, at least another minute. I didn't even want to get up here. I, I wanted all my people to hear. My coaching is what exists. AFL, CIO, not one union who serves the farm workers, all you got to do is check out and go on Google, and they have the homies union. I need help from those in this room because that place is turnkey. And my quarterback, you know, Ted Burke, I haven't had Mike with him, and we're going to have concrete next steps to see what it would cost to create a promise. So please, pick up the telephone, check out, where they have this homies union, but they also have what we can have here, the homies, a club at Cabril. And all of you, aren't you ashamed that less than 100 people voted at the electing the student trustee, student body president? So no board, no staff. I'm moved by my vision. And with much respect, I remember when you first sat in that seat, you do too. Justin, Zach, we're going to miss you. We all are who we are. Time out. Bye bye. Thank you. Hi, Marianne Lobalbo, Public Works with the um, SEIU. And I just wanted to say that um, I love working at the county. I've been here 17 years. Ooh, I'm excited. And one of the things I've noticed, I went back to school, I got my degree. I've been on many interviews, plenty of them. And I thought, you know, one day I'll go look at my bo my booklet that tells all the reviews I've ever had. And I did that about a few years back. Not one person has ever looked at it. And I look at it as some of our higher management, sometimes they get into positions and they think they're better. But I really think we need to bring back or start a 360 review. Um, they've been talking, the um, personnel has been talking about this for over 10 years, and I'm hoping to bring that back because I think a lot of great people who are leaders here in this county that could help us get further on. And um, because you know what, when you're treated badly in a position, either people leave or they tell at least 10 people, and I bet you it's more than that. Like, have you ever been to a bad restaurant? And how many people did you tell how bad it was? And how many of those people tell how bad that restaurant was? Well, guess what? I think a lot of what's happening with the county, which is really sad, that people are saying they had a bad time in their position, they were treated improperly, they were micromanaged, things like that. And what's happening is they'll tell someone else and they'll tell someone else because bad news travels faster than good news, as we all know, because... I know how behavior change is hard because I'm working with recycling and solid waste, but I'm going to get it done. And I'm hoping we're going to start having all of our waste here in the county source separated at the desk, not by the custodians because they not do it. But, hey, we're going to get things better. And um, good luck. Thank you. 
Hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Carissa Lopez. I'm a therapist at Santa Cruz County Children's Behavioral Health. And I came here today to tell you to please listen to us um, with inflation rates at an all time high since the 80s. We need more too. Um, and what we are being offered is just not acceptable to a living wage here. Um, I will know, I will never be able to buy a house with these wages. I will never be able to support a future family when I want to have children. Um, and I'm sure there are many more of us in the same boat or those that do have children already and need support. Um, there are only two crisis clinicians for Watsonville and for Santa Cruz um, for children's behavioral health, and I am one of them, and we need more. So if I'm out of the office and my coworker is in North County, the person that's in crisis and feeling suicidal has to wait at least 30 minutes to be met with um, while one of us transports to the other county, and that's just unacceptable care. Um, also, just the safety for our MERT team and the Crisis Now program is also unacceptable. They're alone in the building at Emmeline, which is not necessarily the safest place to be without security or managerial staff there to support them. And in general, I just wanted to say that as therapists and as people in healthcare, we're here because we care. We want to help kids. We want to help people. And so please care about us too, and please help us too. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm currently a temporary extra help worker here for Santa Cruz County. Um, since I've started, I've been working a full work week, you know, 40 hours a week. And after taxes, after money being taken from my paychecks, I can barely afford to live in Santa Cruz. Um, I moved here four years ago for school, and I love this community and everything Santa Cruz stands for. But the county itself has just been a disappointment. I mean, I tell people back home, family, like I'm working for the county and they're so excited. They're so proud. But sadly, I'm not proud to work for the county. I mean, almost half of my paycheck after taxes are taken, almost all of it goes towards rent. And I mean, I myself, I'm young, I'm youth and like have a lot of opportunities in life. But it's so sad hearing these people like a single mother can even afford things for her for her child. She's moving like being priced out of Santa Cruz and Watsonville and like. It's kind of like intimidating being up here, but someone has to someone has to say something, you know, like working 40 hours a week, doing as much work as people who are permanent. And I can even have a sustainable wage to live in Santa Cruz to stay here, you know, be a part of this community that I love so much and everything we stand for. And it would be nice to see the county reciprocate that and show that you guys care about us by giving us a decent living wage, allowing us to afford things. Things are getting completely expensive. I mean, you go down here, like if I want to take my lunch break, that's like, and I don't bring food, like that's half of my like that's half of my hourly wage. And like, yeah, that's a choice that like us make, but that's sad. You know, like a single room in Santa Cruz can range anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. And that's like half of a temporary extra extra help paycheck for someone that works 40 hours a week. So I think like I would like one day to be able to afford one of those beautiful suits that you guys were wearing up there, but I can't because all my paycheck goes towards my living expenses. And that's the truth. So please, like Santa Cruz County, like you have to do better. Santa Clara County, the same position that I'm working, receives $26 an hour and benefits. And I don't even see anything close to that. So thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Excuse me.
Yeah, are there any other members of the public who are present who like to speak to us at this time? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to online and see if there's any members of the public who are online who'd like to speak to us. Yes, okay. sure, we have speakers online. Kennedy, your microphone's now available. Kennedy, your microphone's now available. Yeah, if you can close the doors, that'd be great. As a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Okay. Good morning, board. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Ken Cosker, and I recently retired from Santa Cruz County after a 30-year career with the County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency. I'm here today representing a problem that retired the County of Santa Cruz workers are now facing. County retirees have recently been notified that their health insurance rates are increasing by 30% starting in 2025. This is a huge increase especially for retirees with limited income and more than one person on their health plan. Right now, there's over 900 retirees actually living, uh, living and uh, 800, over 800 are still living in Santa Cruz. Uh, and we all know the high cost of living here and how costs for food and energy have increased. We're requesting that the amount that the county contributes to retiree health benefits be increased to help cover these huge increases to our health insurance costs. The county contribution towards retiree insurance has not been increased in a number of years, and it's really time to take a look at these rates and adjust them accordingly uh, to these uh, increased health benefits. We've worked hard. We dedicated our lives to public service over many years, and um, and you know, before you know it, you, you all will someday be a retiree too. And believe me, it happens very quickly. So we would really appreciate your support in helping us uh, with these huge increases in the insurance rate uh, costs here. So thank you very much and have a great day. Casey, your microphone's now available. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Casey Vanden Heuvel. I am a business representative for the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104. I am also the president of the Monterey Santa Cruz Building Trades Council and also vice president for the Central Labor Council for Santa Cruz County. I say this because labor is at my heart and having dignified workspace and a dignifying wage is what we need here. We stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters from SCIU and I wanna say you have a unique opportunity to not only improve their lives, but pay a respectable wage to the. We need not just a livable wage, we need a life's wage. When these workers are respected, the services improve. So I ask you today, you have the opportunity to improve hundreds and thousands of people's lives. Give that opportunity, show that respect, and let, let me. And I want to let know that SCIU frontline workers, brothers and sisters, she metal workers, local 104, stands with you in solidarity. Have a good day. Eric, your mic's now available. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Eric Christen, Executive Director of the Coalition for Fair Employment and Construction. We're a statewide organization that was formed 26 years ago by union and non-union construction firms to oppose discriminatory union-only project labor agreements. I want to start off by once again thanking the county for doing their due diligence on this issue. I know there's a lot of political pressure to put a discriminatory PLA into place. You've done your homework on this. You've done your research. So has your staff, and we appreciate that very much. Um, just a quick reminder, project labor agreements for the 85% of the construction workforce in California, that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics out of the Labor Department that has those numbers. Um, the PLA forces those people to have to pay into health, welfare, and pension plans they'll never vest in. That money's lost to them. That dissuades non-union construction firms from subjecting their employees to that type of wage theft. Um, the non-union construction firms that make up the majority of the local construction uh, community simply won't bid a PLA because they're limited to only using a few of their own core workers at all. 
your project labor agreement, which you're trying to negotiate with the unions as a pilot project, we just encourage you to continue to push for fair provisions that do not force non-union local contractors that have a local workforce to only use a few of their workers while the rest have to come from a union hiring hall, including many from outside the area, and that those benefits do not have to be paid into a union trust fund they won't invest in, but instead will go in, they'll be able to keep their current uh, plans. Lastly, just look at what happened to the city of Watsonville with their project labor agreement on their WWTF electrical system hazard mitigation project. They went out to bid with a PLA, came in at $25 million. They went out and rebid it without a PLA. Local contractor with local workers came in at $19.9 million. That was the engineer's estimate. That was savings under with no PLA. Thank you very much. Before we can go into the next week, I think we can open reopen the doors at this point. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. <laughs> Marilyn Garrett, medical freedom is a human right. First and foremost, mandatory vaccine laws are a violation of the basic human right to voluntary consent without coercion to any and all medical procedures, tests, experiments, and preventative measures. The Nuremberg Code was established following World War II based on the fact that all medical products have an inherent health risk and serious side effects, vaccines included. I am reading from a document called Learn the Risk dot org knowledge action health it's titled vaccines for health or profit question mark compiled by brandy vaughn who was brandy vaughn she was a former merck pharmaceutical sales executive who left the company because of quote the pharmaceutical industry's agenda to make and keep people sick for profit and take away our rights to decline medical procedures, treatment, and pharmaceutical drugs, unquote. In December 2020, Ms. Vaughn, the founder of the educational nonprofit organization LearnTheRisk.com, previously called Council for Vaccine Safety, died unexpectedly at the age of 45. Because of her outspoken criticism of the pharmaceutical industry and numerous anonymous threats to her life, Ms. Vaughn wrote in December 2019 post, if something were to happen Thank to you, me, Ms. Garrett. Rex, your microphone's now available. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Board of Supervisors and staff. My name is Rex Heim with Western Electro Contractors Association. I'm here to speak on consent agenda item 22, the pilot project labor agreement. WECA is a premier electro contractors association in California. We have a federally and statewide approved apprenticeship program. Our apprentices are sponsored uh, throughout their program by our contractor members. So it is an earn while you learn system. Uh, safety and training are high priorities and we want to make sure that the, these apprentices have the ability to create uh, their 8,000 hour jobs to climb the ladder here in California. And uh, discriminatory project labor agreements that we've seen in the past explicitly discriminate against all of WECA's apprentices just because of where they choose to get their education. Uh, that is something that is completely unfair, and I would urge you to continue to do your due diligence, which we are very thankful for. Uh, continue to educate yourself on project labor agreements, uh, staff and the supervisors, and we are more than willing to have any further conversations about how this can be fair and equitable in, in the times of 2024 to make sure that just because of where you choose to get your education, you are still able to work locally on your own county's projects and open up all of those opportunities to create the most wealth for the people in your area. Thank you very much for your time.
Faye, your microphone's now available. Hello, Faye Yassini with the Associated Builders and Contractors Northern California. We're a trade association representing 73,000 construction workers across all trades in Northern California. Here in Santa Cruz, we represent dozens of big and small businesses, some of them family owned who have been building the community for years. I'm speaking on item 22 under a consent agenda. We thank Santa Cruz County supervisors and staff for upholding the principles of inclusion and making an effort to hear different perspectives from all stakeholders regarding the pilot project labor agreement. We ask the county while they're conducting their thorough research, they also take into account the consequences of PLAs and what happened with the WWTF hazard mitigation project in Watsonville when it was open to bid with a PLA and then without a PLA. While you're putting the PLA together, please avoid clauses that would restrict competition and construction projects and instead include terms and conditions that would allow for the most qualified low bidder to win the project based on merit. Do not make an affiliation to a union a prerequisite to work on a project. By doing so, you'll have discriminated against most construction workers. Please include fair language in your PLA to promote local hire and participation in projects based on merit and avoid clauses that would allow for wage theft and discrimination and recruitment. Please ensure that your provisions will at all approved apprenticeship programs to work on projects and make up for the construction workforce shortage. And at the end, we also urge you to consider the cost that conducting a PLA will have on the county. Make sure you're putting taxpayer dollars to good use and whether a PLA is even necessary. Thank you. Call in user ending in 1224. Your microphone's now available. Hello? Yes, we can, can hear you. hear me? Uh, good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. This is Carmen Herrera Mancier. I'm the Executive Director for El Pajaro Community Development Corporation. I'm calling from um, our office in Watsonville. I'm here to um, support um, item eight in the regular agenda um, in the approval of the ordinance uh, for the uh, establishing the two-year pilot program to permit the micro-enterprise home kitchens as uh, an organization that promotes equal access to economic opportunity. We consider that this is a way of supporting our community in um, participating in the economy in a way that will allow them to achieve um, economic mobility and um, and this um, microenterprise kitchen can serve as a way of incubating businesses that can grow and and then transition to uh, a bigger business and create jobs in the community. Uh, we I also want to um, say that um, I we're here at Pajaro Community Development Corporation and its team is here to support this project in any way possible. Uh, we're hoping that these permits are going to be, you know, inclusive of every community and we're here to help uh, with education and technical assistance uh, for those um, aspiring entrepreneurs that want to venture into starting a home kitchen. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to collaborating with the county in this project. Thank you. We have no further speakers here. Okay. I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions or comments on the consent agenda. I'll start with Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to start by coming on item 30, nomination of Michael N. Balch for Emergency Medical Care Commission, and thank Supervisor Friend uh, for this appointment. Um, I will also just note uh, for my colleagues in Districts 3 and 4 that uh, this important commission has uh, occasionally had trouble meeting for lack of a quorum uh, and would invite them to submit nominees for the Emergency Medical Care Commission. On item 34, affirming support for the installation of sitting benches along Highway 9 and 236 in Boulder Creek. I just wanted to thank the Boulder Creek Business Association for uh, volunteering 
uh, these benches. And uh, even though it's it's outside my district, it's um, certainly within the first district. We're looking for ways uh, for for public private partnerships to improve um, the overall look and feel of the community. And I think this provides a good model. And finally, on item 35, accepting the county emergency operations plan, I want to thank. Uh, the operation of response or um, office of response recovery and resilience for this great plan it represents a lot of collaboration of course uh, pieces of this are are the mou with santa clara county uh, the voad or um, uh, agreements with the volunteer organizations assisting in disaster this um, the, a lot of work was done with, like the supply chain resilience table talk exercise uh, with neighboring counties, San Benito County and Monterey County, as well as uh, some of the cities. So just an incredible amount of collaboration represented in that report. Um, I'm excited about uh, just the heightened level of preparedness that it, it means for our community. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Supervisor person. any comments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, um, Supervisor uh, Koenig, for recognizing the benches on Highway uh, 9 and 236. I want to thank the Bullet Creek Business Association, a very active uh, community-oriented uh, group that uh, has done many things up in the San Lorenzo Valley for many years. And in Bullet Creek, as is the case with most of San Lorenzo Valley, uh, the state highway actually is Main Street. Uh, this is where people live, work, and uh, shop every day. So these improvements are really designed to make uh, our community more welcoming uh, up at the San Lorenzo Valley. So thank you to the Boulder Creek Business Association and working with the state on these highways 9 and 236. Um, again, on item uh, 35, I want to thank the staff of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience for bringing this plan to the board. I think it's a good time to remind us uh, that we created the OR3 uh, four years ago with the intent of providing emergency services and went uh, as well as leading the recovery efforts after the uh, CZU fire. Uh, since then, it's it's also included uh, climate adaptation uh, work, and which is an enormous task on its own. Uh, so thank you to our three team for taking all of this on. Uh, We've got a lot, we're facing a lot of things we did not anticipate, we did not want to anticipate, but uh, we're responding to the best of our ability under some very trying circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, first, I'd like to commend all the workers that came out and spoke out. I, you know, it's, uh, I think unions are important in all workplaces, and I think that it's uh, vital that, they, that the workers come out and express what they're feeling. And so on item 37, I skipped one, but item 37, uh, I want to thank Sheriff for uh, continuing to work with Janice and increasing the budget there. Uh, I know that they're just opening up a new facility in South County. Uh, they already have one, but they're, they're expanding to a residential uh, center. So I'm really excited about all the projects that they're doing. Um, item 22, you know, it's... Uh, Glad that folks had the opportunity to speak and, and meet with us as well uh, on the PLAs. Uh, but I thank staff for also moving this forward. And that's it. Set them backwards. But first, I also want to start by thanking our employees for coming out and expressing their concerns with our upcoming labor negotiations. Um, I think we're working really hard to try to resolve um, these negotiations in a timely manner. I just wanted to see if I can invite up the personnel director just to speak to the timing of you know, when when we're meeting and our availability to meet with the unions, um, because I just wanted to be clear and maybe on the record that, you know, we're really working hard to try to resolve this in a timely manner. So maybe you can just speak to the meeting schedule. Sure. Good morning, Ajita Patel, personnel director. So we are set to meet this week on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And then we also have bargaining scheduled on Monday and thereafter. We'll be working with SEIU to look at calendars again, should we need more days. I just wanted to be clear that we're, you know, we're going to be meeting with them frequently. Oh, yes, absolutely. For the remainder of the week. Thank you. Um, in addition to that, um, item number 35, just want to thank OR3 for bringing this um, operational emergency plan forward. Um, it's just really critical that we're staying on top of how we're going to address disasters in our community. And just want to express my appreciation for them bringing that forward today. Um, item number 39, this is um, 
accept and file notice of intent to establish a human services department advisory group and take related actions. Um, I wasn't supportive of this when it first came, so I'm going to register a no vote on that item. Um, I just have some concern with the fact that the board will no longer be able to appoint people to that advisory body and um, those meetings being um, not available to the public. And those are the same con concerns I had at Previously, when that item came before the board and just wanted to um, register my no vote on that. And then finally, um, in our written correspondence, item number E, um, recognizing September as uh, Service Dog Awareness Month, I just wanted to um, briefly acknowledge uh, the fact that we do have two service dogs in our um, district attorney's office. Nalani, which is their flagship dog, has been working as a comfort dog with their victim service team for the last seven years, is actually scheduled to retire on September 17th. And so we just want to thank uh, Nalani for her seven years of service in our community. And they also have a dog named Topaz, who is employed as a facility dog at the Sky Center, which is their multidisciplinary interview center for children who are victims or witnesses or witnesses of crime. And so just wanted to highlight two of our service dogs here in the county and want to thank them for their service um, to our uh, community. And so with that, I'll turn it back to the clerk or actually I'll turn it back to the board for a motion on uh, consent. I'll move consent with the registered no vote on um, second chair. Okay. So we have a, a motion by Supervisor Friend, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez. And with that, I'll turn it over for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. McPherson. And Chair. Aye with the no one thirty nine. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will move on to our regular agenda. And with that, we will start with um, item number seven, which is a presentation from Save Our Shores on their 40th anniversary annual cleanup day, which is on September 21st, 2024. And I'll turn it over to Krista Rogers for the presentation. Good morning, everyone. I have slides and thank you. Wondering how I move those forward. <laughs> thank you. All right, good morning. My name is Krista Rogers. I'm the program manager for Save Our Shores. And I'm here to talk about a community event that's been going on for many years in Santa Cruz County. And this year we're celebrating our 40th anniversary of the annual Coastal Cleanup Day. So excited to share this event with all of you. Um, but for those that are not familiar with our organization, our mission is to foster thriving and sustainable ecosystems in the Monterey Bay and surrounding habitats through equitable environmental action. A little history on how our organization was established. We started as a grassroots movement to prevent offshore oil drilling in the Monterey Bay. And we've had some amazing accomplishments since then. On this timeline, you can see that we organized the first Santa Cruz cleanup day in the early 80s and leading into what that event is today. Outside of our cleanup events, we do a lot of other programs. So what we do today is education, outreach, advocacy, and action. And what we're most popular for is our beach and river cleanup. So the role of these events is to engage the community in issues of marine debris and collect community science data that informs policies aimed at reducing trash from traveling through our watersheds and out to the Monterey Bay. At each of our events, we collect data on the types of trash that we find. And this data is utilized in all of our programs, so our education, our outreach, and our advocacy. So this graph shows you the top five items we've collected per year over the past 10 years. And the majority of those materials are made of plastic. So a lot of our advocacy efforts focus on plastic items. To give you an example of an advocacy campaign that we're currently partnering with local organizations and entities um, is the Ban the Butt campaign. So I know that some of you are hearing about this, but this came about from data that we collect at our cleanup events. So for example, on this graph, you can see cigarette butts is the number two item over the past 10 years that we've collected throughout the Monterey Bay. 
Um, in just 10 years, our volunteers have collected almost half a million cigarette butts from our beaches, rivers, and other outdoor spaces. And that's just a very small snapshot of the amount of cigarette butts that are out there. We can't be out there every day at every location. So that is just a very small percentage of the real problem. Now on to our 40th anniversary of annual coastal cleanup day. This is the largest cleanup and volunteer event of the year. And Save Our Shores has been the regional coordinator for this event since its inception back in the 80s. So we started just here in Santa Cruz County and today it has grown to include Monterey County as well. So Save Our Shores coordinates cleanups throughout the entire Monterey Bay area. In the mid 80s, we partnered with some other organizations to collaborate and be part of the largest data collection experiment in the world. So starting from just north, north coast of Santa Cruz County in the early 80s, we now clean up all around the Monterey Bay and it's taken off statewide as well as internationally. So we have international and statewide collaboration through the California Coastal Commission, as well as the Ocean Conservancy. And all the data that we collect on this day goes into the Ocean Conservancy's database, which they use in their international marine debris reports. But this event would not be possible without community members supporting it. So we get to dedicated community volunteers that go through training with Save Our Shores to lead each of our cleanup sites, as well as community members that come out on the day of the event and participate at one of our cleanup locations. And then they're collecting all that data that we use in all of our programs, as well as to the Ocean Conservancy. So it's a really joint effort. We are the coordinators, but it takes the community to make this possible. To give you an example of some data from last year in 2023, we had almost 1,300 volunteers come out around the Monterey Bay. We cleaned up 50 locations and we collected over 5,500 pounds of debris in just three hours. So it's a huge impact in a very short amount of time by an amazing group of people. Now this year, 2024, 40th anniversary of annual Coastal Cleanup Day is on Saturday, September 21st from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And we're gearing up to host 64 cleanup sites all around the Monterey Bay. Our volunteer registration is open. Um, we hope people will visit saveourshores.org to learn more about this event, see the locations that we're hosting cleanups at, and sign up to participate. This beautiful image doesn't include all of our cleanup sites, but most of them are represented there. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much for your time to talk about this event. It really is uh, community supported and our organization relies on your support, the community support. We hope you all will join us in continuing to support this event for many years. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to see, I know this is just a presentation, but I'd like to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak on this item here in the chambers. Seeing none, I'd like to see if there's anybody online who'd like to speak to this item. Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Caroline Garrett. Corporations privatize profit and socialize the cost. We're cleaning up corporate pollution. I have in front of me the Santa Cruz County Greenways recovery news from spring 2024. Talks about planet versus plastic. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it starts out with a false statement Humankind has produced over 9.2 billion tons of plastic. Humankind? No. Corporations like the oil corporations and another publication I have is from Food and Water Action. 
And there's a picture here. New shell plant brings pollution and plastic. And it states shell polymers Monaco is a massive plastic producing cracker plant in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. This flaring event in September of 2022 is one of the many that have alarmed nearby communities. Flaring emits toxins, exposing them to dangerous pollutants. The challenge is the domination of the corporate state that is polluting the planet. People naturally want to clean up. But why is it permitted in the first place? Microplastics are everywhere in our bodies and the environment. Another publication from the county says plastic plague COVID-19 unleashed a tidal wave of plastic waste. You did Thank that. You, Tim, your microphone's now available. Oh, cool. I get another chance to speak. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Cool. Um, yeah, I, there are some things I agree with the lady that last spoke. You know, I, I feel that uh, corporations around our world are doing horrendous damage. And uh, that's part of also part of the issue with healthcare and and my issues, you know, that I mentioned to you a little bit about my struggles with uh, guardianship over my mother. So the whole thing here is it just seems like there's a whole lot of greed all across the world and all the rest of us, we're all trapped in it. So it's, it's quite a bummer starting to see how this is all unfolding. And I'm not so sure, you know, where it's going for my children worldwide. So it's a worry. You know, I, I wish there were, there was some way to get these folks that are at the top of America's corporations and corporations worldwide that have enormous wealth to try to contribute back to American society and all of us that are lower, middle, and just standard upper income individuals, you see? So that's the whole thing. So she, you know, she's right about this one. You know, it shouldn't be put on all of us and we should be put into this situation of suffering in regards to taking care of each other and our families and our environmental situations that are being thrust upon us. So I, I hope that there's somehow that there's a way to stop all this because I see it firsthand in caring for my mother. I see it firsthand in all the damage up in Lake Tahoe. And I see it firsthand in all the degradation I've seen in the state of California over a lifetime. And it's disheartening. I would really like it to stop somehow. Anyways, thank you very much. You folks have a fine day. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'd like to bring it back to the board to see if there's any board comments on the presentation. Where's it coming? I just want to thank you, Executive Director Thompson, for a great report. Um, and it's heartening to see not only the impact of um, the, the organization's efforts, but also that, that how much that has spread throughout the state um, and really inspired other communities to do the same. And um, also particularly uh, want to thank you for your efforts around um, reducing cigarette butt litter uh, as a sanctuary steward have done a lot of cleanups and absolutely they are uh, most frequently picked up recognizable item, right? Uh, the other, I think the, the leading item, item is plastic pieces, which is pretty darn generic. Uh, and even their cigarette butts are, are almost neck and neck. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Manu. And I'm oh, sorry, I was just going to add that in our area, yes, plastic pieces are number one, cigarette butts are number two, but the internationally cigarette butts are number one. Yeah, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, Save Our Shores and its efforts over the 40 years. It's been phenomenal. And uh, like many others on this board and throughout uh, Santa Cruz County, have been uh, participated in many of the cleanups. Uh, we had a plastic revolution in this country, it seemed like. We just went from glass to plastic. And now we need to have these uh, second-use containers. Uh, it's up to us to make that decision and that choice. Um, we're going to have to reverse uh, what we depend on for 
plastics. Uh, usually it's water or something of uh, liquid content. But um, I do appreciate everything you've done. Uh, the people who have been there, including you, before you, uh, what you've done to expand this throughout this uh, area, throughout the state, now the nation, they, it is usually not, uh, uh, it's not unusual for Santa Cruz County to be at the first uh, on the front of the line for uh, environmental movement like this. And who knows how many how many uh, natural resources from fish to wildlife and all that we've really uh, saved. And uh, it all gets back to us in some form sometimes. But uh, thank you very much for everything that you have done. And Save Our Shores is really a stellar organization. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'll just express my deep appreciation um, for all the efforts that you all have done over the years to help protect our environment. And also just want to acknowledge that um, with around the advocacy of stopping offshore oil, I want to just thank Supervisor McPherson for his role at the state level to help stop the expansion of offshore oil drilling as well. And your advocacy groups are really important um, when getting people to take action. And so um, just want to thank you for that. And then also just congratulate you all and thank you for um, being the lead organization to help organize um, the annual Coastal Cleanup Day. 40 years is really impressive. A lot of folks will, you know, you know, do it for a while and then want to back off. But you all have been committed for 40 years and expanding this from not just Santa Cruz County, but throughout the entire Monterey Bay. And it's just impressive to see on a single day how much trash you all pick up. And it helps raise awareness to the fact that we all need to do better and we all need to do our part. So I hope you all have a successful um, Coastal Cleanup Day on September 21st. And uh, thank you for the presentation here today. Thank you, Justin. Hope to see you all out there. Have a good day. All right. Um, with that, uh, before we move on, I just want to see if someone um, from staff my uh, screen has gone out. And so I'm just wondering if somebody maybe can help me with a little technical assistance.
showcase with you a little bit of the details and we hope to have a conversation with you just how to make this a, a success for our community with that i'll turn it to olga suniga our consumer protection uh, manager for environmental health and she'll pass it to director um andrew strader from our environmental health Greetings to the board, uh, county administration, and the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you for entrusting us with this project. So I wanted to start off by describing what is a micro enterprise um, home kitchen operation, or a MECO for short. A MECO is a small scale home based food service facility where food can be prepared for pickup, delivery, or dine in service. Because it's designed to be small scale, Food preparation is limited to 30 meals a day, no more than 90 meals a week, and a maximum of $100,000 in gross annual sales a year. Sorry. Uh, food must be cooked and served the same day because the act of cooling perishables is considered a uh, higher risk. According to California law, a local jurisdiction must pass an ordinance or resolution to accept MECO permits. This requirement allows each jurisdiction to decide whether this type of service is right for their community. On September 19, 2023, the board requested that we explore a MECO program. So with that charge, this is what we did. We consulted with other MECO counties. We met with other enforcement agencies. We met with nonprofits promoting small business, and we solicited public input. This survey that you see here is something we posted on social media to collect uh, public input. Based on that research, we proposed draft ordinance language. The draft ordinance uh, proposes a two-year pilot program to evaluate whether it works for our community. It includes language that adopts and adheres closely to California MECO regulations. It clarifies how we would apply state laws locally. For example, it sets our standard for potable water. It includes provisions for requiring property owner, property owner approval. Our county is unique in that we have a lot of properties on septic system with little expansion, poor soils, and high groundwater table. A septic system failure would be quite costly to a property owner, depending on conditions. The draft ordinance reinforces illness exclusion and reporting regulations, and it establishes permitting, inspection, and enforcement process. And now I'm going to hand it off to our director, Andrew Strader, who will explain all our internal evaluation of the MECO program. Good morning, board. So in addition to uh, paying attention to all the details of the you know the state uh, law with, with regards to MECOs and, and establishing the program as we put forward in the county ordinance, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about our, our internal focus uh, or, or review of our staffing and uh, the fees and our the financials of the program. And then I'll, I'll finish up with a, uh, our recommendations to the board. For you to consider so we did sorry so we did look at our staffing um uh, and evaluated our staffing we you know obviously we don't know the exact number of micos that will end up coming our way uh we've based a lot of our numbers off of a initial estimate of 30 uh but it will remain to be seen you know how many we actually get um we did move around some other program um programs uh, to uh, clear up some room within our consumer protection staff to accommodate this at this point uh, and whether you know we'll have to make other changes in, in the future we'll 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 evaluate over the course of the pilot program we also evaluated the program costs uh, we uh, in order to develop fees we uh, you know, have to kind of estimate when we have a brand new program based upon our experience of you know with the time it'll take to do uh, various aspects of the program and we'll get into that in a moment uh, we also reached out and compared our uh, the fees uh, with a lot of other counties and you'll see some comparisons uh, shortly uh, our plan is 
that we will return to the board with a separate resolution for the fees uh, as that's not included within the language of the ordinance. So today we're proposing that we have two fees associated with the micro enterprise home kitchens. Uh, first one is uh, 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 what we're considering right, calling right now a home evaluation or and also uh, the application review. Uh, it will consist of not only the application review and some uh, standard operating procedures that, that the applicant would have to provide to us, but it also uh, would uh, include a home visit where we would uh, review the space that they're going to be working in, the menu that they're going to be working with, um, and other aspects of, uh, of the home business. Uh, the second permit category there is uh, the actual operating permit. Uh, and so this would be the permit to actually operate the business on a continuing basis. So the home evaluation uh, fee is a one-time only fee, and this is, uh, and while the operating permit would be an annual cost. Uh, some counties do it in this fashion. We believe this is a fair fashion to do it in versus just having everything uh, built into the permit cost, uh, because again, uh, if you do it all annually under a permit fee, then they char get charged that fee every year. Um, also, if they uh, if we end up denying a permit for any reason, uh, they would only have to pay the home evaluation application fee and not have to actually have paid the permit fee. So, well, let me back up real quick. Sorry, I uh, just wanted to say. So, you know, those those fees of uh, the four hundred and seventy dollars for the home evaluation fee and the five hundred and thirty, as you can see there, um, we did provide some state averages um, to compare uh, both in the Bay Area as well as the state in a greater whole. Now, as you can see with the state of the home evaluation, uh, our fee is significantly higher than those averages, but. Um, that's a little bit misleading because um, some counties charge just on an hourly rate. And so it's unknown how many hours they will actually chose. So those averages just reflect a one hour uh, fee on their hour hourly rate. Also, several of the counties have a separate hourly rate for review of the, the standing standard operating procedures, uh, which is in addition to the uh, home evaluation. So while those averages look lower than ours, uh, uh, in reality, we expect that it's a lot more close to the ballpark that we are proposing. Uh, and then it's we're pretty close on this uh, around the state average uh, uh, for uh, for the operational permit, and uh, and at the moment proposing a, you know fairly. A lower level than say with the Bay Area counties have been proposing recently. So with that, for your consideration, we are recommending the following um, to approve the ordinance and concept, uh, add section 7.150 to the county code and schedule a second reading for September 24th, 2024. Uh, direct staff to begin permit intake. Uh, you know, in in our recommendations in the board letter, we did uh, put two months after adoption, uh, but uh, we can be flexible with that adoption rate. And and Supervisor McPherson's proposal for uh, January first would be acceptable. Uh, uh, then we would also offer to report back to the board after one year. Uh, giving you a status of you know how many places uh, our Miko's permits we've issued, uh, any issues or concerns that we have either through com complaints or other barriers that we encounter, uh, as well as um, any staffing or those kinds of issues. And then after the two-year pilot program ends, uh, come back with a, 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 a even more full assessment of how the program went over the last couple of years uh, um, and and any adjustments that we would need to make or recommend that the board make uh, to the program and whether or not uh, we should continue the program. And with that, we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, we also have a, I just want to make sure that folks are aware we do have a time certain item of 1045. So we're going to try to get through this um, pretty quickly so we can move on to that. But so I'll open it up to questions and I'm going to reduce common time on this item to one minute. So if there's any member of the public here who'd like to speak to us on this item, please step forward at this time. Seeing none, I'd like to see if there's any member of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we have speakers online. Lauren, your microphone's now available. Uh, good morning, Chair Cummings and members of the board. My name is Lauren Wolfer. I serve as Outreach and Advocacy Director for the Cook Alliance. We are a nonprofit committed to legitimizing the sale of home-cooked food. Um, our organization spearheaded the legislation that originally created the MECO permit in 2018. And since then, we have actively worked with counties and um, health departments throughout California, as well as supported permitted home-based culinary businesses through education, resources, and grant opportunities. Um, we're really grateful for Santa Cruz County Health Services and their work on this. A MECO program will enhance food safety um, and make more education and resources available to the home cooks that are already operating informally in the shadows. This will also provide the community with access to one of the most affordable pathways to culinary entrepreneurship. This fosters new small businesses, increases access to fresh food, and will create a more resilient and diverse local food system. Um, throughout California, the MECO program has upheld an excellent health and safety record. Um, there have been early concerns expressed by cities about potential nuisance issues that have not materialized. Um, for example, San Diego began Thank their Thank you so program. much for your comments. I'm sorry, we have to cut you short. Caller 1192, your microphone's now available. As a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next speaker. Call in user three, your microphone is now available. So I haven't read through the staff report. Um, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned the fee, which sounded pretty high, and I wondered if that would be a deterrent to actually doing this micro enterprise home kitchen operations. And I, I wonder, I'd like to hear from what's the current requirements from for home cooking? Is this too many unreasonable requirements? Um, maybe someone could elaborate. Those are my questions. Thank you. I circle back to call in user 1192. Your microphone is now available. It appears they either no longer wish to speak or are not able to connect. We have no further speakers. Chair. Right. I'll bring it back to the board for any um, questions, comments, and Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Supervisor McPherson, for bringing this item forward together with uh, our office. I'd also like to thank uh, both Jan Brown and Allison Diolante and our two offices who worked pretty extensively on this over the last year. I mean, I think that this is a, a, a really important opportunity for members of our community who um, as we even heard earlier, are, are struggling financially, and this is an opportunity to both diversify the local economy, increase entrepreneurship, and in particular in South County, that I represent an opportunity uh, to legitimize an operation that's already occurring and to provide a regulatory framework for food safety uh, that needs to occur. This is, I think that this is fits so perfectly within the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship of Santa Cruz County in general. And uh, from an equity perspective, uh, really lifts up um, and, and state research on this has shown that it's disproportionately uh, lower income members of the community and, and, and populations, well, historically marginalized populations that engage in, in this, that, uh, that, that engage in MECOs. And so I think the degree that we can help elevate that, that is important. I'm supportive of the, of the minor adjustment on this. And I want to also double back on, on the great work that you did on this. I know that this is, is taking a little bit of a leap of faith uh, for your team um, uh, in our first conversations to where we are today. I understand that. Um, but I think that you created a very reasonable regulatory framework that, that people can come around. So thank you for that. Thank you. 
Yeah, the comments supervisor. Very just briefly, I also want to thank staff, particularly on all the outreach to other counties, really to make sure that we are incorporating everything that they've learned uh, in going first into a now um, sort of best uh, best practice um, policy moving forward. I think the fee schedule is very reasonable. I really appreciate that the division between the um, the initial home inspection and then the annual inspection. Um, and um, overall, really excited to see the impacts of this program. I and mean, I, I couldn't agree more that, um, you know, really by creating this framework, we're um, eliminating one of the biggest barriers, I think, to anyone starting a new business, which is uh, the need to find space in a space constrained county um, where, where uh, rent, particularly on um, commercial kitchen space, can be extremely high and hard for even the most established organizations to find. So really creating a great foothold here uh, for people to start climbing the economic ladder. Thanks. Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any comments? You know, as uh, Supervisor Friend mentioned in South County, um, this is going to be a, a vital tool for folks to use. Uh, we had a caller that called during the public comment uh, from Pajaro CDC, and they got a kitchen incubator that brings forward and trains um, kitchen entrepreneurs. And I think that this uh, MECO pilot program is going to be essential and it will give many the opportunity to both work from home and most importantly, allow them to create a micro business within the community and a legal framework as well. So thank you, uh, staff, for putting this together. All right, I just, um, well, I want to share um, um, my colleagues' comments on this item and want to thank Supervisor Friend and Supervisor McPherson for their leadership on bringing this forward. Um, I think it's going to really help a lot of people who are trying to get off the ground and, you know, test the waters in terms of their ability to run a small business. And, um, and just want to thank staff for all their hard work on this. I did um, have one question. Would this be applied in the unincorporated parts of the county or would it be incorporated in the cities as well? And if the cities wanted to do something, would they have to pass their own ordinance? So just understanding where this would be applied. Yeah, it's applied across the county, including the cities. Right. Uh, the cities are, are somewhat restricted in restricting this once the board approves it. So... Uh, you know, they would just be working with their, you know, business licenses and, uh, and you know, handling complaints through code compliance as normal. So then I, I think there may be, um, and I appreciate that. And then I think given that there may be one, a need for one minor change on page number 25, um, home with Amico must meet the following minimum criteria as verified through a home evaluation by an inspector. Item number five. Um, says have properly functioning septic systems that are not negatively impacted by MECO operations. I think it might be better if it said have properly functioning septic systems where applicable, given that some folks in the community will be, um, they won't have septic. Like, for example, if you live in the city of Santa Cruz, you're not going to be on septic. And the minimum requirement is to have septic as it's written in the language. Then just wanted to make sure that it's clear that that's applicable in areas that where they're not connected to plumbing. To I systems. completely agree. That's We'll make that change. Right. So if we can include that as a minor change that under five, it says where applicable after septic systems, um, that'd be appreciated. Okay. Um, all right. With that, I'll turn it back to Supervisor McPherson for the motion on this item. I move the recommended actions uh, with the additional direction to make this ordinance uh, uh, put in place by January 1st, 2025. And with uh, what uh, the minor adjustment that uh, uh, Supervisor Chair uh, Cummings mentioned. So I, I make that motion. Second. And also, you don't leave office until January 6th, so you get to enjoy this for five days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Friend. I'll ask for roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all so much for your work on this. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to item number 10. We'll, he we'll hear item number nine after item 10. Item 10 is consider status report on the collective of results and evidence-based improvement requests for proposals and take related actions. It's a presentation by our human services department. And so I will turn that over to uh, Randy Morris and Kimberly Peterson. Uh, 
Okay, good. Good morning, Chair Cummings, members of the board, and those who are watching. Um, and thank you to the clerk of the board who's going to hold on pulling up the PowerPoint until I make a few introductory comments. I'm joined here by Kimberly Peterson, the deputy director of our department. And I want to make just one introductory comment, and that is to recognize that this presentation is a partnership with the city of Santa Cruz. The city of Santa Cruz invests just over $1 million of their general fund to join with your board's nearly $5 million of general fund to pool money together to put out to the community for competitive bid to provide services to our community. And as is our process to ensure we work together lock and step, uh, Kimberly and I will be working with the city manager's office this afternoon and at the city council chambers, hence the time certain thank you. So we can be freed up to get to the city council this afternoon. Um, so with that said, we are gonna walk through a very brief PowerPoint uh, presentation. So thank you to the clerk of the board for um, accommodating. Uh, so the next slide. Um, and clerk of the board. Okay, we have it now. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of what we're going to cover. Uh, we are going to remind your board and the community the timeline with which we are working under and where today's hearing fits. We're then going to remind uh, the board and the community um, the decisions that have made to this point that then queue up the updates and what we are talking about in today's hearing so you have this all in context. I will turn it over to Kimberly who's going to give an overview of the summary of the many applications we received. We then queue up two very specific requests of your board to give us direction so that we can return then in November with recommended awards based on what your values and priorities are. And then we will close with what the recommended actions are that you are voting on today. So this is the first item. This timeline was brought forward to your board and the city council in December of 2023, approved as the framework for this process. At that time, we had recommended based on lessons learned from community feedback and elected official feedback that we wanted to narrow the focus of where general fund from the city and county would go because there was too much unmet need and not enough money. So your board approved um, focusing the RFP, which we'll speak about in a little bit. We then returned in April to your board and the city council for review of and approval to release the RFP. Applications were then um, put forward and today's hearing, which is listed here on the timeline, is where we are today to have a new um, hearing that has not happened before in our community with this procurement, which is to give the elected officials in the community an opportunity to look at what has been submitted for review, for consideration and seek your direction so we can return with recommended awards soon and finally we then have a long runway of over six months before the contracts transition which was one of the lessons learned last time the omicron variant pushed us out way too close to the end of the fiscal year and that was a frustration for everybody so this is just a couple comments about reminders about what got us here today i already mentioned this was significant amount of time spent with community-based organizations elected officials who were interviewed and public hearings to talk about how to improve the process in a way to move this in a direction that better met the needs of all the next three buckets here speak to how your board and the city council agreed to parse out the nearly six million dollars of money and i just want to remind everybody of those decisions that were made number one one of the core conditions of well-being is affordable housing and shelter and it was agreed upon by the board and the city council to parse that out from competitive procurement and to leave that for procurement and action through the housing for health partnership which will be the presentation next today and we'll speak more about that then second the last bucket speaks to direction from your board and the council to leave a percentage of money available for elected officials after the recommended awards come forward for your consideration to sort of make decisions about unanticipated priorities or award contracts of importance to you that represents about 15 percent of the bucket the $668,000 is about $550,000 for you and one hundred and twenty-four dollars for the city. Um, and that has left $3.79 million that is out for procurement today. I do want to put in perspective, I've been here just shy of five years, and there is a lot of attention and energy around how decisions get made for these awards. I understand that because most of the contracts we give to community-based organizations are dictated by federal and state statute and structures and parameters that leave little discretion for local elected officials. So this is the one bucket of money that you have full discretion over. But I would be remiss if I did not put in context 
this amount of money is less than 1% of the amount of money spent in Santa Cruz County to fund the safety net, which is over $600 million. And when you pull the contracts from the healthcare agency and our human services department and put them together, this is just about 2.5% of the contracts we actually have with CBO. So it is, I think, noteworthy how much attention is paid on this particular dollar amount, given it is only 2.5% of the actual contracts we have with organizations providing service in the community. And then finally, before I turn it over to Kimberly, I want to remind your board that we did some, I th think, very thoughtful analysis of looking at the budget that your board approves every year. We looked at the eight core conditions of well-being, and we looked closely to see where are we under-invested in general fund, and that is what led to us recommending that we focus where we have less general fund investment, and your board approved the focus on what is these three areas in addition to the um, affordable housing one that we'll speak about in the next presentation. That is lifelong learning and education, healthy environments, and finally, thriving families where most of the current money is spent. But I do want to highlight for your board and the community watching that there are two impact areas in the core condition of thriving families, that services to older and dependent adults and children and youth. And those are sort of bucketed out differently in our presentation so you can see the amount of proposals in those two areas. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly to talk about where we are today. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. So the RFP was published on June 3rd and closed on August 2nd. As detailed in your attachment B, there were many trainings and technical assistance opportunities available for potential applicants. Formal support ranged from trainings on the core framework and tools to utilizing the online application platform. Informal group coaching sessions on specific core conditions or tailored to participant needs and individual assistant sessions were available for organizations wanting individualized support. Next slide, next slide, please. While the RFP was open, we issued four amendments or minor changes to the RFP. Amendments are commonplace in RFPs when the changes are modest enough to do administratively without coming back to the board. In this case, three of the four amendments were technical fixes and one modified the RFP schedule and sequence of appeals, as you can see on the right side of this slide. This aligned with county procurement practices. Next slide, please. And what you see here is a summary of the applications received and as detailed in attachment C in your materials. 100 applications were received, totaling over $15 million worth of requests, or over four times the amount of funding available. For reference, during the last RFP cycle, the requests represented two and a half times the amount of funding available. This slide demonstrates a breakdown of the applications received according to core condition and tier. If you look at the far right column labeled total apps, you can see the total number of applications received by each core condition and the dollar amount of funding requested in each of those conditions. If you look at the bottom row, you can see the total number of applications submitted by each tier and the dollar amount of funding requested in that tier. One of our key requests for you today is to get your direction on how to make award recommendations, considering the amount requested is so much greater than the funding available. We have two options for you to consider. The options were developed with the assumption that you would like to see the funding distributed across all of these core conditions and tier categories that you see here. The difference in the options is whether you want to recommend awards based on the dollar amount in each category or the number of applications you see in each category. Both options assume you would only want to fund competitive applications and that you would want to fund at least one application in each of these categories. And I'll speak more to the options and what they mean on the next slide. So here is a summary of the two funding distribution options, which are detailed in attachment E in the materials. Option one would distribute the available funding across core conditions and tiers based on the dollar amount of funding requested in each category. 
and option two distributes the funding based on the number of applications. The dollar amounts you see under each column represent the dollar amounts that would be allocated to each core condition and the number of applications that would be funded under each option. The options really represent a calculus of distributing funds based on the amount of money requested or the number of applications submitted. Both options are based on the assumption that you would like the funding distributed across each of the core conditions and tier categories that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, as staff, we are recommending option two because it funds more applications. And in the past, there had been an interest in spending, spreading the funding more broadly. I do want to briefly highlight why it is that we're asking for some direction today on the funding distribution. And the reason is that if we do not get any guidance on how to spread, spread the funds across the tiers or core conditions, then theoretically it could happen that we would return to you with recommendations based only on the highest scoring proposals overall across all of the categories, which would mean that theoretically, um, all of the funding could go to one condition or one tier. To avoid that, we felt we needed to provide options for ensuring the funds are spread more broadly. And we felt it was our responsibility to provide you with one, a recommendation among those options. We do, of course, welcome any dialogue, public feedback, um, or additional direction on this premise and our recommendation. And then one other thing we want to do today is follow through with our prior commitment to provide you an opportunity to identify funding carve-outs for any particular services or programs. During prior board meetings, we said you would have a chance to identify funding carve-outs prior to recommended awards. And we are making a point to provide that opportunity for you today. Should you choose not to do any carve out from pro competitive procurement, we want to remind you of the other flexibilities you have available to you. You do have 15% or almost 670,000 between the county and city set aside that you can use to identify unanticipated priorities that are not funded competitively. The reason that there's an asterisk next to the 15% on this slide is because as detailed in the board materials, remaining funds from any category will be added to the 15% set aside for elected discretion. And then finally, as CORE is 100% general fund, when we return to you in November, you have the authority to override any of the recommended awards. If, on the other hand, you do decide to carve something out from competitive procurement, then we would also ask for guidance on where to pull that money from. And with that, I will turn it back to Randy. So this brings us to the end of the presentation where I just want to summarize the four specific recommended actions we are asking you to vote on today. The first is the standard to accept and file the report that we've submitted. The second is we are asking for specific direction from you. This is your opportunity with this information in front of you to give us direction on a funding distribution formula. And Kimberly articulated why absent that we have concerns based on lessons learned from the past. You don't want a just best application highest score wins. You want to spread it in the ways that is your priorities. Third, we need a specific vote on whether or not you want to carve out something and what that is or not. And as Kimberly said, if you do, we need to have some staff conversation to make sure we know from what bucket we're pulling the money from. And then finally, to direct us to return no later than November 19th, at which point we will bring back the recommended awards, which are based on your direction from today as um, uh, coupled with the um, rating panels who are in process of reviewing and ranking the uh, applications right now. And with that, I close and turn it back to the board for any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the public to see if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to this item before bringing it back to the board for questions and, and action. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Jennifer Merchant with Gray Bears. Um, I would like to strongly advise that your board select option one, and I'm going to talk about the two main reasons um, that that is our preference. 
First, your board and uh, the city council and your staff have already done a lot of good work in selecting the most meaningful impact areas that were outlined by your staff today, including the thriving families and older independent adults category that's important to Gray Bear's hard work. By reallocating based simply on a number of proposals, or the amount requested, you're re risking the work done to date to identify those priority areas. To refocus that um, correlation away from impact is concerning to us. And we would like to see any proportional allocation based only on community impact first and not only the unrelated number of proposals submitted or amount requested. So if you're going to use option one or option two, while we prefer option number one, we think that that should be applied after the scoring is done so that you can have kind of a, a double tier look at that allocation. Because I think that while staff is correct in saying that if you only applied it to the ones with the highest scores, if you went the other way and said, well, it's just gonna be a percentage of proposals, the percentage of proposals are not corollary really to anything and certainly not the meaningful impacts that have already been determined by your board in the council. Uh, Gray Bear's concern is that by choosing funding option number two, there is a risk of diluting the effort that went in creating the impacts of these focus areas. And specifically, it's confounding to us that it allocates half of the funds that are available to seniors and thriving families in the other option. So um, I see I'm out of time, had a few more words, but I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and for your staff's work. Thank you so much. To any other member of the public, please come forward. Hi, uh, yes, uh, my name is Tony Nunez. I am the marketing and communications manager for Community Bridges. So uh, thank you for uh, holding this session and for all the work that you've been doing on the core applications. Um, we would like to um, ask the, the County Board of Supervisors to also go with the best application wins out uh, method as well too. And for all the reasons uh, that uh, was just stated is um, we need to uh, look at this as an impact-based um, application and we need to uh, figure out where the best uh, or where the biggest impact can be had with this very uh, small amount of funding that we have uh, before us that's that's flexible and can meet the needs of the community um, to the point um, that the previous speaker said as well too um, you know Seniors are our largest growing uh, population. Um, there's just a report in the Santa Cruz Sentinel just over this weekend that the number of homelessness uh, among seniors is rising and also that the resources are extremely limited. And so um, I advise you to also take a look at that as well too when you're determining um, how to allocate some of this core funding. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public here present who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, I'd like to see if there's anyone online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair. Helen, your microphone is now available. Thank you. And good morning, Chair Cummings, supervisors and staff. I'm Helen Yoon Story, um, Assistant Director and COO of the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, the county's designated anti-poverty community action agency for almost 60 years. As you know, we provide an array of anti-poverty and equity-based services um, that serve over 12,000 low-income people annually. We're also pleased to work in partnership with the county as a current core funded agency and have applied for several initiatives in the 2025-28 core RFP process. Um, today, we're here to encourage your board to consider waiting to identify priorities for the 15% carve out for emerging needs until November or December, both to see if the RFP recommendation process or after the election, as we saw in 2016, there are any immediate needs or service gaps that emerge. Whether you delay the decision or not, we also encourage you to prioritize an equitable distribution of the funds based on the demographics of poverty in our community. Additionally, um, and I know that there's some differences on this potentially, but we urge your support of funding distribution option two, which would support the maximum number of grant awards to meet the needs identified in the community. And given the large number of proposals submitted addressing a variety of needs uh, in our high cost area, we also encourage your board to look into any additional funding that may be added to the core process to help address these needs and support proposed solutions. 
Thank you for your consideration and partnership to make an equitable impact in our county. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. I want to thank those members of the public who spoke to us on this item. I want to bring it back to the board for any comments and comments, questions, and discussion. So I'll start actually to my left to see if Supervisor first. Yeah, comments. I just want to thank the uh, Human Services Department for what it's done. You're, you're trying to uh, align a Rubik's Cube, which I can't do, uh, into some very complicated situations that has been controversial at times. But uh, when the board approved this core process, the collective of results and evidence-based investments uh, for the process several years ago, our goal was to really create a a better process. And I think that you have done that so that we can address the needs of the most vulnerable citizens in our communities. Uh, we also wanted nonprofits, especially the smaller ones, uh, to propose a new and creative programs that could be uh, addressed and uh, improve the lives of uh, more of our county residents. Some of the organizations uh, historically uh, received certain amount of money uh, in prior years and did not like the competitive process, but a few of those organizations really didn't complete uh, well in the first compete well in the first round. Um, but we we learned lessons from core round one, and I really appreciate the the dedicated effort that we've that our, our department has put into this. Um, they responded well. I think the department did uh, adjusting the second core process to address the concerns that came up um, and the evaluation. Um, and even during the second core process, the county staff continued uh, to make adjustments and ensure that um, we had more transparency, more notification. And so these community organizations knew how to address the, the program that we've established. <laughs> But with 100 applications, as has been mentioned, and 53, or <clears throat> not 53, thank God, 15 million plus uh, applicants, um, it, it's clear we're not going to be able to please them all. And that's uh, this is one of the more fun um, decisions we make, and at the same time, the most challenging and uh, sometimes uh, disputed decisions we make. Uh, but I think that the process we have is a good one. We ought to stick with it. Um, for those of you that would like to criticize the county and the core RFP process, I invite you to read uh, a detailed seven-page report that is before the board today and that we're considering. And in all fairness, um, the county staff has gone to great lengths. You really have uh, to ensure that we have a fair and balanced professional process. I think you've established that uh, as well as you can under the parameters that you're faced with. Um, it's controversial in some respects, but it's also very rewarding in others. Uh, as you said, it's just 1% of your, your budget for human service needs in this county, but it's a critical one. And I, I want to say that uh, we have a, many community-based nonprofit organizations. I heard 700 plus in this county. And uh, just to think about, well, 100 of them have made a, an application to this. And for us to try to fit and fill the needs as best we can. I think that your your criteria and your process is really well aligned, and I really appreciate what you've done uh, to let us move along to make a final decision later this year. Thank you. Professor Hernandez, do you have any comments? Well, first, I want to thank the staff, and I just want a question, uh, kind of uh, what the folks in the public comment were, were alluding to. It's my understanding that we're not just selecting the highest scores, but is there like a rubric or criteria for what the lowest scar lowest acceptable scores are for accepting these RFPs? Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to answer. So uh, I did want to clarify that even with option one or option two, all of the proposals would still go through the scoring process. And what we would do is we would take the score, the final scores as um, determined by the panelists and uh, and then apply whatever option you choose over those scores. So within each category, it would be the highest ranking scores in that cap in applications in each of those categories. So just to clarify that. And then we do, um, we did identify what we called scoring floors. Um, and um, that is just to acknowledge that, we know this is a highly competitive process and that, that um, you want to award competitive um, funding. So in the medium, excuse me, in tier one and tier two, the medium and large size um, tiers, 
um, under which there's the highest number of applications. Uh, the scoring floor is 80, meaning that no organization scoring under 80 would um, be awarded funds. And that's based on the last round where um, it's based on the average score from the last RFP and also no no, no um, awards were made last time underneath that 80 score. It's pretty safe that there's going to be plenty of applications scoring higher than that. And then for the um, tier three or the small tier, no organizations scoring less than 60 would be eligible for funds. Did that answer your question? I think so. Mm -hmm. And a really brief one too. Um, I noticed the difference in what the payout is for option one and two. What's uh, One is higher. Is there... Do you mean the... Um, the two options we had before it's, us. Uh, it's the exact same amount of money oh. available. Exact same amount of money available. It's the Rubik's crew, I think that Supervisor McPherson referred to. We felt it important to lift up to the community and to you two ways that were simple to apply a calculus and they just land differently. And they are based on, I want to add an assumption to what Kimberly said was the assumption that we believe you would want the money spread around proportionate. It is also based on an assumption that the community-based organizations, we give them some credit for knowing what the need is in the community. So both option one and two say, let's just recognize rather than inserting staff values and staff opinion, let's award proportionally based on number of applications or the dollar amounts. They're just two different choices and we thought for a minute to just leave it to you, but we thought it was more responsible to say, let's pick one and we pick the one that just funds more, but Supervisor Hernandez, it's still the exact same amount of money. Got it. Supervisor Connick, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, well, first, just wanted to commend staff on a much more transparent process this time around um, than the, the previous round of core. And I think we've made great strides in um, yeah, all improving the process. Appreciate it. Um, I want to ask about uh, matching funds. I know that we talked about prioritizing applications that have matching funds. Um, and it's my understanding that actually a very high number of the applications have said they're able to leverage funds in one way or another. Do you know about how many that is? I think there are two questions in there. I hope I'm on point. To the number 76 applications met the criteria in the published RFP to get extra points for displaying that they leverage funds. I think your second question is, and I have been working on what leveraging means in my career, it's a word that gets used and filtered and thought of differently by different organizations. So it is very, very difficult, if not impossible, to say we have one metric that recognizes what a matching fund is. So some, literally, the local general fund dollars are needed to draw federal and state dollars. Some just braid together well and sort of leverage other things. Some make them more competitive for an application but aren't a literal leverage. But we tried to write it in a way that it maximized the number of organizations that would get some extra points for showing that they're sort of leveraging in some way, with the exception being the small grants, because the small grants is a lot to ask a small organization to also be able to uh, maximize. So that's why a majority of the applications get the leveraging points as articulated in the details of how that's articulated is in the materials. Gotcha. Right. So I think that, so 76 out of, I think, about 100, 100 applications have been basically two thirds are, are saying that they're leveraging in one way or another. Um, I, mean, I would think that we actually want to put a finer point on that focus and say, you know, where is there certainty or that, you know, it's a, the money is going to be matched versus just, in, for example, increasing. Uh, the competitiveness of a competitiveness of then an application for other funds. I mean, look at the end of the day, um, being able to fund only one out of every four requests, or at least you know for dollar amounts, um, it's just it's clearly not enough money. And so our goal is just to bring as much money into the community and apply it to these um, you know needed services as possible. And I think that's where that request for uh, looking at matching funds came from. Um, but I, you know, I really think we need to look at it in a way that it really ensures that we arrive at that point of maximizing funds rather than saying, yeah. I, I maybe want to take a minute to say something that I hope lands for our community-based organizations as a deep respect. Um, I think this is actually testament to how hard it is to be a community-based organization, and it actually shows how hard they work to find a way to leverage other dollars. I actually think it's a testament to the fact that 
it was very difficult, if I heard your words correctly, to refine it to a point where we're ruled out because most of our CBOs cannot survive without having the medium and large ones without finding a way to leverage a lot of other grants, philanthropic, federal, state. So I, I believe that that is what we found, is that we have a very sophisticated group of CBOs who know how to survive. <laughs> um, I would say if this is on point, if you would like us to bring back during the recommended awards, any effort we can to refine and distill and share a little more as part of the materials we publish, I think we could do that. I just don't know how far we could go because each of the applications have sophisticated budgets behind them. And it's very difficult to tease out to make apple, orange, pineapple comparisons, but we could attempt to do that if that would be on point. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to incorporate into a motion um, as if, when, when we're ready. Um, the other I guess just comment that I'll share is, um, you know, I think that sort of the the overall division of funds by category in in um, option one makes sense. I'm not as concerned about trying to apply an exact amount to the tier one, tier two, and tier three. I mean, I think ultimately we want the most competitive applications, um, regardless of size. Um, so that's just that's my thinking in general. Supervisor Brennan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, thank you uh, for this work, um, which has been going through a lot of iterations for a lot of time. Um, I'm supportive of staff's recommendations for a few reasons. I, I mean, I feel like just a few years ago when we went through this process, or it wasn't even a few years ago at this point, one of the criticisms uh, from those that weren't funded was the fact that there was these bright line cutoff points or that we were disproportionately or too high funding one program over another. And even though I respect that two exceptionally well-respected CBOs came in and advocated for that today, there were one of the two was actually one of the organizations that was expressing some of the concerns about that exact process just a year or two ago. So I, I, I think that that was actually in response to, in me, I feel like the option two was actually in response to the feedback that came from also from CBOs about not receiving funding, especially some of the larger programs um, in that way, because my, although it would mean more money potentially, it also mean that less programs would be funded or may mean that your program that you're coming and advocating for for higher funding might not actually get funded at all. Um, and I think that, that the biggest concern I heard from some of the board members at that time and from the CBOs was um, there was discussions about transparency, there was discussions about process, but at the end of the day, the discussion was really about funding. And why was a program funded and not my program funded, which is why I think that the 15%, um, I know it's considered an elected official set aside. This is all an elected official set aside. I mean, we have flexibility to do whatever we need to do. But I think that that's where this discussion should actually be occurring because right now we're kind of operating in an intellectual phase. And once the recommendations come out, then there's going to be a hundred CBOs in here asking different questions. And then we have a 15% number that, that from either a policy or political standpoint, this board at that point with no need for data and no need for anything other than whatever it is that's guiding your, your uh, better angels can actually be funding the thing. And I think that's where we're going to, I mean, that's just the reality we're going to end up. I've been through this process a lot. I feel like the old person up here right now having this discussion, but we've been through a situation where it went from no process to a process. And I think that the next iteration of this, that the next board's going to very near, seriously need to consider is whether the core process as it currently is constructed should continue or whether as we carved out the money for Dr. Ratner's team, because that was a, very specific called out issue that the board and community wanted, whether we have these sort of four buckets, this is the amount and that process of procurement is very different and simplified. Because you've heard me say, and I didn't mean to be flippant when I said it, but we're basically spending like $10 million in staff time to allocate $5 million. I mean, this process, when you look at it, there was a hundred meetings. I mean, just think about it. And no one's still going to be happy about the process at the end of this. I mean, we can also be honest about that. There has never been really, well, maybe one person has come in and complimented the process uh, to be fair to one CBO in the room right now. But I think that that's where this is going to end up. And so I think that that maybe in the next procurement process, there should just be a look of reformation and saying, look, it's $5 million. We have these buckets that we want to fund. It should be simplified in how we do it. These are the key priorities. And then those things can be an individual procurement processes. As a result of that, I think the best option that's before us is is the staff recommendation because it still provides that that flex. I don't think there should be a carve out today I, or direction for a carve out. I think that the 15% that should be allocated on that last, functionally the last day, 
when the board sees what doesn't get funded and to the point of Ms. Story's uh, comments that there could be things that occur between now and when this is even evaluated, just like in 2016, on, and in particular on women's programs that weren't being funded, where there was a very specific need at that time. And I think that that would give the board that flexibility on the 15%. So I'd be supportive of just the recommended actions uh, before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, well, first, I just want to start by thanking everybody for the time that they've spent working on this. Um, it hasn't been an easy road, but um, I'm sure that there's opportunities for refinement in the future. Um, I do just want to acknowledge, though, that the reason why that there's a lot of attention put on this is because that while the county spends, you know, upwards of $600 million on safety net services, these are some of the smallest nonprofits in our community. And for many of them, this is a lifeline for them to be able to stay afloat. And so I just want to acknowledge that because the nonprofits in our community take a lot of time to apply for these funds because they're not eligible for other funds or they have challenges with accessing other funds. And for small nonprofits, you know, this is an opportunity for them to kind of get their legs under them. So I just don't want to diminish that these funds really do help support a lot of our partners and just organizations that want to get off the ground in the community. And so I um, just wanted to, to make that comment. Um, I do share some concerns that have been raised by some of the nonprofits in the room. Um, we don't have any scoring before us, and we don't know which applications are getting, or get, you know, we have very limited information about the different applications, and we have no idea where they fall out on the rankings. And so for that reason, for me, it's really difficult to say, do we, you know, Go with option two, which would, you know, kind of break down the funds a little bit more and spread them further over organizations, or do, do we go with option one? And I think that really comes down to the fact that, you know, we really want to better understand, you know, how they're ranked in terms of where how they meet community needs, the previous success of these programs, um, the quality of their applications, whether it's a new program or it's been an existing program. I think for me, it would also be helpful to understand how much money they currently get from the county because some of the you know, if there's a lot of smaller organizations that don't get funds from the community, from the county, but then there's larger ones that get significant amounts of money from the county, who do we want to prioritize? And I think that that will get filtered out as we see the applications and we see the scoring of the applications. So personally, what I would like to see is, you know, we get the scores back and then we have the options for funding come to us at that time, since we then have a better sense of what the different programs are and what the different organizations that we're considering funding. And um, additionally, I do, and I agree with Supervisor Friend, you know, I think at that point in time, we can consider what the carve out would be and who would be allocated towards because we better understand what programs are getting funding, which ones are, are not necessarily being recommended for funding. And then at that point, we could, you know, allocate the carve outs um, during that time. And I know we've done that in the past when we've had these, pro these kinds of um, uh, this process come before us, well, at least when I was on the city council. Um, and then I guess lastly, um, I think it would be, I think it would be beneficial if we had this come back in January of 2025, because this is a three, we're making decisions on three years worth of funding and we have two new board members who are going to be joining us. And so for two of those years, they won't necessarily have any say over how these, which programs are getting funded. And so I just think that it would also be beneficial if this, if the scoring package comes back in January and the recommendations come back to us in January so that new board members and the new board can actually decide on how this funding is spent. So I'll leave my comments there and we'll open it up to see if there's any further comments from staff or further comments from board members. I feel like there's a number of things on the table. I'm going to attempt to respond to them. Um, one we're tracking is Supervisor Koenig's reference and we're making a note whether it's additional direction or not, we can share at whatever date we come forward the best we can do to analyze further leveraging for reasons I understand. Two big uh, things I feel are were just added to the table that I want to just quick quick comment on. Would need to consult with um, probably GSD who manages the uh, county procurement process and perhaps even county council. But my understanding is we have a current RFP out that had been published and approved by your board that speaks to a timeline. And to change that, I believe your board has authority to do that. I just think as staff, a matter of pragmatism is I understand the political nature of the request. And this process is representative of the last three years of dialogue with your board that has been seated to effectuate. So that's a decision for you to make. I think there would be need to be a quick consult on whether or not that could change through a vote of yours and how that would uh, adjust um, the timeline. But the most significant one is 
I don't see a practical way, and I welcome my colleague Kimberly to speak to this if she sees it differently. I don't see a practical way to change the request for asking you to give us direction on option one or two, because the way the RFP is written is we need to issue notice to the applicants of their our intent to award or not so that the appeal process can start so that we can then bring back to you full recommended awards. If we delay all that, I think we change the RFP structure. And I think we begin, I worry, to start down a slippery slope of what happened last time as this process got moved out so long that it got too close to the time to close the current contracts, start the new ones, transition, um, people getting services. So I just start to see a creep there that I think practically would get very complicated to effectuate. And I just literally don't know if we can change the process. We can see if council has something to say because the RFP structure speaks to a timeline that your board approved. We'd have to change that whole structure if we didn't come back with recommended awards after an appeal process. That's what's currently the published process. I just wanted to add that the, the scoring is underway. Uh, I think it was in the materials, though not, we didn't state it out loud, that um, we recruited over 65 panelists to review the applications. They went through training as had done, as was done previously. They've, you know, taken their time to review the applications and will come back together in their, um, their panels before um, the final scores are determined in those um, small groups. So, so that is underway. Um, and then that's, so that's one reason we don't have more information for you today. We're still in the middle of all of that. I think that, uh, yes, and, and Randy articulated that the options are before you to help us prioritize how would you like to see the funding distributed and the idea is that people would have been notified in the appeal process which is really a administrative process takes place before we come back to you with recommended awards because you as the board have the board authority to override any of our recommendations and chair cummings can i um share with you a thought that we have in case this is on point and might meet you where the point is you're bringing up if i'm understanding your question um because we don't have the applications completed and the timelines we had we were able to get in place what's in attachment i forget what it is which just gives the name of the organization the tier it's in etc we do plan to bring forward when recommended awards come forward a more thorough and robust list of everything that says like the application, the program, et cetera, so that you can see in front of you fully everything that came forward. And then you get to see the rankings, the end results of the appeal process, and you get to look at everything that came in and make a decision to just narrowly use the 15% or override. So all of that is material we plan to bring to you in November with the recommended awards if this is approved actions today. I can ask a quick question. Um, when are the when is the scoring supposed to be complete? Because I'm wondering if the if the scoring can come back to us prior to if 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 you're talking about a short timeline, then um, and I'll just say it again, it would be great if this could come back in January. But it would be helpful if the scores could come back to us sooner, so we could then make a determination whether we want to go with one of these two options. Because in the absence of having knowing what's being prioritized, it's really challenging to understand how we want to fund these different programs. The scoring process is targeted to be completed in October. We are in a we are in a pretty tight timeline, um, to be honest, and so that then there is time for the appeal process, which again is administrative because as your decision as board members, it's not really appealable. Uh, so the um, then the appeal process would be carried out based on the scores and recommended funding on that administrative process, and then we would bring the awards to you in November. Well, I'll, I'll just have a. I start with a motion so we can have that discussion. I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction from Supervisor Koenig on uh, the leveraging information. Um, and if there's a second, I'll continue this conversation. Professor Friend, you also mentioned in your comments about the carve out portion to delay that. Are you still? Well, it asked for what today was the day of whether or not we wanted to create a carve out. Um, if we're not creating a carve out, I don't know that we have to create directions saying we're not creating a carve out. The 15% is part of the recommended actions of uh, the quote unquote elected official carve out, which is to me basically means as we make the determination of who's funded or who's not funded, we have the flexibility with that 15% to make those decisions at that time. That's what the recommendation is saying. 
May, may I chair Cummings attempt to clarify something? Yeah. I wonder if the word carve out's being used in two ways and getting conflated. One recommended action today is to seek direction from board if you, and I'm gonna be very slow to make the point, want to carve out a particular program from competitive procurement and direct us to fund it no matter what. That is one way the word carve out is up there in the four That's actions in front of you to vote on is you would specifically say, if I'm understanding the nuance of this, and we as the board do not recommend staff go carve out and just fund something. Second way the word carve out might be used, and may I recommend not using that word and just say, your board has already directed us to leave 15% of the total amount of money available to the side so that when we come back with recommended awards, you can see the recommended awards and then you look at that 15% bucket of money and you can then make a choice to do whatever you want with that. So that's, if that's helpful, that's what I'm so thinking. So that's helpful, that's my motion. Yeah. So with this additional direction, so I just need to know if there's a second so we can continue this conversation. Well, I'll, I'll second it. And so in November, we also get the additional information of, of uh, all the applicants that- You, you will have a list of recommended awards. Okay. And if I'm following back to Supervisor Cummings' comment, you will see a full more robust list of everything that came in, the name, the program description, et cetera. And you'll have all that in front of you that time. Okay. So to the additional point on that, um, while I appreciate um, the chair's attempt to give me less work to do <laughs> before I leave, at the end of the day, um, you know, you're not elected for three and a half years, you're elected for the four full term. And I could apply this to almost anything that we're voting on today. We have multiple things that are coming back in January as a result. So um, this is something that this board's been working on ad infinitum. And so this is the board that should be seeing it through. We've all inherited things, the previous boards and decisions and actions. Uh, so the timeline should stay as the timeline is. But anyway, that's, so the motion doesn't change the timeline. I appreciate there's a second. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll turn it to the clerk for roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. No. And I just want to say for the record, I appreciate all the work um, on this, but there's just certain things that today I'm not comfortable with supporting this on. So, but looking forward to continuing to work with our board members and the CBOs to see this process through. And I just want to thank you all for your time. Yeah. Okay, so with that, we're going to go back to, uh, is everybody okay with moving forward? Do we need a break? Yeah, I'm going to go. All right, so with that, we're going to move on to item number nine, consider status report and presentation on the 2024 future, future of Public Health Initiative and Community Health Indicators 2024. And I will turn that over to staff for a presentation on the side. You know, Mr. Chair, you might show, uh, we'll probably go to break then before 11. Is that, I mean, number, item number 11, or do you want to go to there? I just, what's, for those who are here for item number 11, do you want to do that before we break? Uh, is it at noon, or what time do we have? It's 20 minutes too. I think we can do it, yeah. Yeah, good. Yep. Yeah. All right, so we'll have staff come forward on this item, and then we'll follow that with item number 11. Hey. Good morning, Honorable Board of Supervisors. My name is Emily Chung. I'm the Public Health Division Director and Health Services Agency. It is a pleasure to be here again presenting to the board. Thank you for this time and attention to allow Public Health and Health Services Agency to provide updates and highlights of our work around public health. The last time that Public Health presented broadly about our divisional activities, we came talking to you about COVID. And I'm pleased that we get to talk about moving forward and the future of public health and what a growing developing organization looks like and how we will strengthen our services to this community ongoing. With me today, I have Dr. Lisa Hernandez, our public health officer, who will be presenting uh, the second half of this presentation. In the audience, we have Monica Morales, our agency director, uh, who's available if there's any questions directed to her. and. Um, Pam Connolly, our division deputy director, is unable to join us this morning, but I want to acknowledge how much she's contributed to this presentation and the body of work as part of Future of Public Health. 
Today's presentation will include a report on the future of public health initiative, as well as a report on our community health indicators and community health assessment priorities for 2024. The future of public health initiative is a um, is a initiative that the state has funded for local health jurisdictions in California. And we have a requirement for this funding to provide a report to you as our board on the morbidity and mortality indicators in our county, as well as our work plan for this initiative. Before diving into the presentation, I do wanna remind you all about our public health division's mission, vision, and values. We are a division of 30 distinct programs staffed by 102 full-time equivalent staff. In the board memo itself, we have an attachment which details the various programs and who they serve for anybody who is interested in finding out more. It is difficult to encapsulate our entire division's body of work in a brief presentation. So I wanna acknowledge that we will only be talking about a few small things that we do here. What I do wanna say is that we serve our entire county population. Every day, public health serves nearly 300,000 individuals in this county. And that is through a variety of services, such as our emergency medical services that ensures safe ambulance and medical transport to anybody in need, but also includes our communicable disease team and their investigations of emerging diseases and viruses and threats to our community. We're also mandated through state and local requirements for a numerous um, set of services. And one of the ones that I think is uh, a good example of how we are mandated, and many people don't know that we do this, is that we serve our most vulnerable, severely disabled children through our California Children's Services Program. These are children that require care management and medical therapy services through our public health staff. And this is a small but important population that we are mandated to serve. So you can tell that the variety of services are very different in our public health division. On top of that, of the direct services that we provide, we are the community health strategist for the entire county. We align our public health initiatives and strategies for this whole population through coalition building, collaboration, and collective impact, and build on policies that build a healthier and more well community for all. The future of public health initiative um, takes us back to 2020. 2020, public health and the entire world was faced with a once in a generation challenge, a global pandemic. Globally, public health organizations were underfunded and under-resourced to manage the magnitude of a pandemic. Fast forward to 2022 in the state of California. The state recognized the underinvestment of public health, uh, local health jurisdictions in California that has happened for decades and decided to invest in an ongoing allocation for the local counties and cities that run public health departments. This was intended to support the infra infrastructure so that we can maintain and build our core and mandated services. We focused on and required to build some new permanent positions, which we have primarily already hired for. And we have these ongoing funds with a small cut that the state provided us this year due to state challenges and budget. Um, but we have this ongoing $1.4 million uh, allocated to us to ensure our infrastructure and build on our future investments. As a reminder, the funds provided to us by the state for future public health uh, do not allow for supplantation of general funds, meaning that we have to create new uh, additional programming and services with these dollars. Briefly, our work plan for our Future of Public Health initiative is highlighted here. I'll just go over a few of these items, but the details of the, our work plan are included in the board memo. 
Accreditation is a core part of our interest in building out our public health infrastructure, which helps us ensure that we're holding equity as a through line to all we do to be efficient and effective. So we'll be documenting and in, in and showing and being transparent to you and to our community how we are doing high quality services, meeting all of the domains and standards set, of, set forth in the Public Health Accreditation Board. Our infrastructure, as I've already mentioned, is key to this work, and that will make sure that we can continue our core and mandated services and be ready for the next emerging threats. We as a public health division, respond regularly through our medical health branch and our emergency preparedness team whenever there are threats and emergencies for our community, and this funding helps us stabilize our ability to do so. Being data informed is a high priority for us as an organization, and that doesn't just mean crunching numbers in the background for our, us, but to be able to be transparent and accountable for you and the public with the work we do and sharing information in ways that are readily accessible to others, such as dashboards, data share SCC, which we backbone and help fund, and moving towards results-based accountability scorecards, which we can share to show our impact and our story and how we are turning the curve on health outcomes in this community. We are working towards improving our efficiency through fiscal and administrative tools. And we have exciting innovations that are coming and being implemented now, such as a, uh, a, a, new, man a new grants management tool and administrative tool that our team is piloting. Finally, our community health and assessment and community health improvement plans are core to how we will demonstrate to the, our community where we are going next. Understanding the priorities of our health needs now and how we will improve them in the future is what we'll be sharing with you in the rest of this presentation today. Our, uh, we are proud to announce that our ECHA, so our Electronic Community Health Assessment, is now public on datashareSCC.org. The link will be in a later slide, but uh, we'll be referring to this CHA, this ECHA, in the uh, subsequent slides from Dr. Hernandez. So now I'm pleased to have Dr. Hernandez present our community health indicators and community health assessment priorities for 2024. Thank you, Emily. Um, board, it's a pleasure to um, present before you again, and it's a pleasure to be back as health officer and serving this community once again. So I appreciate the time uh, to present uh, the indicators. Um, I will be reviewing the leading causes of death, the leading causes of premature death in our community, disparities in the uh, death rates, and community health uh, uh, assessment topic areas and priority areas with associated data for those indicators. Before I start presenting, um, I want to note that there is a, you'll see a data lag or a data that um, may be as far back as 2020. And this is due to a data lag with the large data sets that we use. So it's something common. Um, however, you will see data as far back as that. Um, some are a little bit more recent, but just wanted you to note that as you see the slides before you. So in uh, 19, in 2020, uh, three, uh, Santa Cruz County ranked ninth out of 58 counties uh, for health overall, and our death rate of 565 deaths per 100,000 residents contributed to that ranking. The top five leading causes of death in Santa Cruz County are Alzheimer's disease, stroke, ischemic heart disease, which is um, number one cause for heart attacks, drug overdose, and hypertensive heart disease. Premature death which is a death occurring before the average life expectancy is significant because it has profound social, economic, and emotional impacts to communities, families, and society as a whole. And it results in the loss of an individual's potential contribution to society. And we see that the leading causes of premature death are injury, drug overdose, chronic disease, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. This slide describes county death rates by race and ethnicity. 
we see that white and black African American groups consistently have the highest death rates. Death rates for white and American Indian uh, Alaska Native groups have gradually increased over time. While Native American uh, by Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander groups show significant fluctuations. Asian and Hispanic Latinx groups maintain the lowest death rates with generally stable trends. These disparities highlight the significant differences in health outcomes among racial and ethnic groups, likely due to factors such as age of the population, health behaviors, social economic status, chronic conditions, and other social determinants. Even I want to emphasize that a lower death rate does not mean that a specific race or ethnic group is living well. Even though the Latinx population has lower death rates and our uh, lower death rates, our next slides will show that their health and well-being is disproportionately impacted. Before I go into the indicators, um, I want to describe what a community health assessment is. Emily mentioned a little bit about that earlier, um, but a community health assessment or CHA um, is a process that uses quantitative and qualitative methods to systematically collect and analyze health indicators and data for a specific community. The goal of a CHA is to identify the top health needs for a community. The Public Health Division conducted a CHA this year. And again, um, the electronic CHA can be found on DataShare SCC. In June of this year, the Public Health Division conducted a session with community members to alert them of the uh, health needs and allow them to learn more about the um, uh, indicators associated with the community health assessment and I'll ask the community members to prioritize health topics to be included in our community health improvement plan. The community prioritized these four topics, access to healthcare, children and adolescent health, housing security, housing burden, and mental health mood disorders. We will be highlighting data from each of those priority areas and reflect, to reflect the current needs and trends that we see in our community. The access to healthcare indicator shows the percentage of adults reporting report having visited a, a physician in the last year. Overall, the county is doing well with a value at 63.8%. And that is compared to the United States and the rest of the state. However, when broken down by census place, we see differences. Freedom and Watsonville report the lowest percentages of adults who have visited a doctor in the last year. While Pasa Tiempo and Rio de Mar on the right hand side, the green bars actually have the highest rates and they are higher than the um, Santa Cruz value overall. 10.5% of Santa Cruz County children age one to 17 years of age have ever been diagnosed with asthma which is better than the state value at 12.3%. However, when we break out by break this data out by county regions, we see that there is a greater percentage of children diagnosed with asthma in South County. The percentage is 14.9%, which is higher than the state value. And when you look at each of the regions, it's um, anywhere from five, uh, five to um, seven, percentage points higher than any of the other regions. About 53% of Santa Cruz renters spend 30% of more of their household income on rent. Compared to other Santa, uh, California counties, Santa Cruz has a value in the best 50% of all counties. However, when we break that value down, by age, we found find that young individuals age 15 to 24 and older individuals 65 plus are spending a significant portion of their household income on rent. Compared to California and national averages, Santa Cruz County fares worse in the percentage of adults that report poor mental health days. 
while the California average is 13.8%, Santa Cruz County has a, a higher and far worse value at 15.1%. The, uh, uh, the percentage of adults reporting more than 14 poor mental health days per month also varies by census place. And we see that Freedom and Watsonville show the highest rates, which are inching closer to about 20%. The percentage of students reporting feeling sad or hopeless every day in the past year has steadily increased from 28% in 2017 to 31% in 2019 to 44% in 2021. Stress, isolation, and barriers to care during the pandemic contributed to that rise. When we compare the data for students who are part of the LGBTQ plus community to students who, that do not identify as LGBTQ plus, the percentages of chronic depression are significantly higher. Notably, transgender students have the highest percentage of respondents reporting chronic depression. While the data I just presented to you for these uh, priority areas are quite sobering, these are the areas that the community has identified that we must come together to improve. This work will be outlined in our community health improvement plan. I will now hand the presentation over to Emily, who will discuss next steps. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. I also want to acknowledge the teams that have put uh, a lot of time and effort into completing this community health assessment from our population health, healthy communities, and beyond um, within public health to build this presentation and develop the ECHA. So we are proud of this body of work, um, but we know that where we're headed is really where uh, really the importance of this assessment. Um, we don't want to just produce data for data's sake. What we want to do is move forward on how we can improve the health of our community, addressing the key disparities and the priorities as, uh, as Dr. Hernandez explained today. But we also want to lean into our strengths as a community, which are many. We've heard um, just the core investments presentation. We know about many organizations that are working on various health improvement activities and the county stakeholders that are also doing the same. So our community health improvement plan proposal will be using strategies on cross-cutting collaboration and convening these partners from across the entire community so that we can address the top issues identified in the CHA. We'll be inviting the community and the public in general to participate in this process. So as uh, in order to get started, we invite everybody to review the ECHA on datashareSCC.org backslash stories backslash 2024 CHA. Part of our work also includes aligning assessments across systems. We acknowledge that there are many organizations who do similar community health needs assessments, and it behooves us to reduce the number of assessments we do in this community and to have a more unified approach. We've started having these conversations with partners that um, conduct assessments and are looking at our healthcare and community partners to ensure that we are consistent and using equitable and aligned outcome measures. We also want to lean into our partner organizations, as I mentioned already, leveraging these, uh, the expertise across our community and uh, addressing tailored, creating tailored interventions to promote equity across the diverse populations is important. While public health will lead the creation and development and be the holders of the community health improvement plan, we alone cannot implement the interventions that will be designed out of this plan. Honestly, there are no funds specifically for the implementation of the uh, community health improvement plan interventions. That is not necessarily what the funding we have available to us will be able to do. But what we want to be um, prepared to do is be the strategist to help uh, look for resources, look at how do we leverage funds, look for grant opportunities that we can um, be working on together across all the systems. 
finally, our focus on systems change and social determinants on health addresses the root causes and the most upstream approaches to addressing disparities. We can only advance health equity if we look at the systems in which we live and the environment in which our communities are facing. And we want to be looking at the policy and the population level interventions that will most greatly impact individuals for health and well-being overall. So in conclusion, we open ourselves up to any questions or comments from the board and input on these uh, this report. Uh, the uh, the board action is just for you to consider accepting of this report, and we are grateful for you and for our entire public health division for the work that they do to support our community. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, at this time, I'll open up to the community to see if there's any member of the public here who would like to speak to us on this item. Seeing none here in public, is there any member of the public online who would like to speak to us on this item? Yes, Chair. Call in user three, your microphone's now available. Interesting presentation in terms of what's being omitted. I hear you talk about root causes or looking in the environment in which we live. And a key factor is this radiation emitting devices from cell phones, cell towers, Wi-Fi, et cetera. Independent research shows this radiation causes cellular stress and damage, DNA damage, blood-brain barrier disruption, increased cancer and tumor risk, decreased melatonin, insomnia, whole long lives, abnormal heart rhythm, strokes, altered brain waves, cognitive difficulties. The county is proliferating this kind of toxicity, making people ill. It's also the vaccines are making people ill. It's not a solution. And I refer you to the book called The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy by Leon Canarot. And he refers to Learn the Risk Dr and a chart that reflects the explosion in mandated vaccines over approximately the past 50 years. There has been more than a 14-fold increase in the number of vaccines injected into children today compared to 1962. All of these vaccines contain a multitude of toxins, including aluminum, mercury, formaldehyde, which have overloaded children to such an extent that it has caused detrimental consequences on numerous scientific studies linking vaccines to autism, autoimmune diseases, allergies. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. Um, so I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions or comments. I'll start with Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Koenig. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm just curious. Is there any way we can get more up-to-date data? Um, in, in reviewing it, it seemed like a lot of uh, our data was sort of up to 2020 or 2021, which, of course, is problematic given the uh, pandemic that we had then. Is sort of like, well, do those trend lines continue? Did they come down? Um, so can we get more up-to-date data or when will we kind of have a sense of what happened in 22, 23 and, and where the trends are headed? Great question. We we feel the same way. It would be great to have real-time data um, where we could look at these um, impacts of pandemic and other um, conditions on our communities. And essentially, this is really a state and national phenomena in terms of the data lag. Um, we spoke to the state and asked that same question about some of the data. And it takes um, sometimes six months to a year for the data to be um, inputted. And then it takes another sometimes a year to get um, the data cleaned up um, and then analyzed. So that's why there is that lag, even though four years is a big lag. Um, some of the data comes out in different times of the season. 
Um, so some of the data will be updated in November of this of uh, this year. So that'll be good, but um, there will still be a built-in lag, sometimes up to two years. All right, um, thank you. Um, I also just want to point out, I mean, clearly the, the data that we do have highlights the um, disparities in health in our in our own county between, you know, particularly North and count. South County to generalize. I mean, I think the statistic on asthma is particularly um, alarming. Um, however, I did note with access to uh, sort of the access uh, to healthcare um, statistics that we were looking at it. Uh, um, well, actually, the, the, the folks who are accessing healthcare the least of all census tracts are, of course, UCSC students. <laughs> Right, and so there is a correlation between age and how often someone needs to access healthcare. Or, I mean, I know that as still relatively young adults, uh, I access healthcare less because um, I feel healthier in general. Um, so, I if there's any way we could control for that, it might give us a better understanding of, you know, for example, how much of South County's uh, reduced healthcare access is based on actual access, based or versus just a younger population. Yeah, that I will have to check to see if we can control, if this data was controlled for age, um, or if not, we can do that data analysis to see. Um, though we know as a whole, um, the communities are not, um, in South County are not accessing data. And um, I'm not considered a young person at all, but I have two young people um, that I've recently launched uh, in, into the world. And um, they go to the doctor once a year. Maybe it's a function of their mother. I'm not sure, but um, that I, I do think that um, it does fluctuate um, based on age, but it also has to do with the health behaviors and, and how people feel about health. I will say um, what we know uh, about certain communities is that they have certain protective um, values in terms of wanting to um, be more uh, health seeking is just uh, the ability to get to a provider's office, maybe because of other barriers such as, as work or transportation as well. And, and yes, those college students are iffy there. Yeah, thanks. Supervisor McPherson, any comments or questions? Yeah, I just think this whole presentation just tells us <clears throat> how much and how dependent how valuable our public health system is here. And to find this data, I I just wonder, um, you know, with the pandemic and all, uh, is uh, how much it it really skewed the numbers a lot, but it's pretty difficult to register to what degree. Is that correct? I mean, I don't know if it, uh, if we wouldn't have had it, we have been on the, you know, and maybe I should say, we we heard a lot this morning earlier about the uh, the thirty open positions and so forth. Would if if we fill those, could that improve some of these numbers from one way or another? I can answer the data part, and then I see um, maybe <laughs> Director Morales can. Or unless Director, do you want to? In terms of the data, um, I'll use the example of mental health indicators for both uh, adults and youth as an example. I think um, the pandemic definitely exacerbated that, um, that trend, though I will say that especially for our youth, we were already on a, a trend, upward trend for having poor mental health in our youth. And it's multifactorial in terms of the, um, the reasons, but some of those um, are will include um, social media yeah, um, right. and, you know, uh, then you couple, couple that with uh, our um, pandemic where we had isolation and um, being removed from some of our social uh, connections in school. So I, I think that the pandemic definitely impacted our um, community's health in a lot of ways. However, we do see that some of those values were um, were rising already and would continue. The only, th only thing I would add to that is that in some ways, the pandemic also highlighted where our community is the strongest, where we have built in um, champions and promotores and leaders 
who can really um, help public health as a division, as an organization, have a deeper understanding of where we need to focus our efforts, which is why the community health assessment and community health improvement plan are going to be so important to have those voices included. So I, as much as the pandemic was difficult and we see the ongoing sequela from it, I do feel like we can learn from it and are actually better off in many ways of how we work together and grow. Um, and we'll see if Dr. Uh, Director Morales wants to say something about the, no, okay. But in terms of positions, um, public health, we have had some attrition, but that's pretty normal. And we did um, sunset over 30 positions due to COVID funding ending this last budget year. So specifically in public health, um, we continue to backfill the positions we do have vacant. And um, we certainly could make more inroads if we have all our positions filled. But as you know, um, attrition does happen pretty regularly. Well, in general, I just um, it's been a very challenging time to serve the community and health services. Um, thank you and to all the staff that have participated and put in the extra hours and dedicated their really their life to making this a better place as best possible under some really trying conditions. Thank, thank you. you. Supervisor Hernandez. Um, I just want to thank you all again for your presentation and just um, Appreciate all the work that you all do to keep our community healthy, and in particular, just really being able to highlight in this report how health varies geographically. And I think that um, it's really important to have this kind of information because as we think about where we target our resources, it better helps us understand what are the populations and communities that really have been neglected over time or that need those resources the most so that we're putting the most amount of resources in the communities that are going to be, um, that are going to benefit the most from them. And so I'm hoping that we can use this report and other reports that help inform um, decision making and funding allocation over time. And so just want to thank you all again for your presentation on this item. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start by making a, a little bit of an apology. Um, our timing has been a little off for a variety of reasons, but we have a time certain item at one o'clock. We have not taken a break, so I think what we'll likely do is go into closed session right now. We'll take a 45 minute break. We'll come back to our um, 1 p.m. Um, time certain item, which is item number 12. And I think if we could follow that with item number 11, because I know there's some folks who are here and who are interested on the um, framework on homelessness, that so we could come to that item after we hear item 12. So with that, that's that's fine. Okay. So we'll take a 40, we'll come back at one o'clock and then we'll continue with item number 12, item number 11, and then item number 13. And there's nothing reportable for closed session. Thank you. Thanks.
next item on our agenda is item number 12. Consider appointing an ad hoc an ad hoc subcommittee to create a Board of Supervisors Procedures Manual and take related actions. And I'll turn it over to Nicole Coburn from the CAO's office to lead us in the presentation. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chair Cummings and members of the board. I'm Assistant County Administrative Officer Nicole Coburn. Um, as you are aware, I've been recently leading the project to review and reform various policies and procedures for county commission's work. And the item before you today is related to this effort. Um, the Board of Supervisors currently does not have any adopted document that details how it conducts its business. At times, this has resulted in um, difficulty for the chair and staff in a variety of areas. One is setting and regulating the size of agendas. Two is sufficiently preparing the agenda creation and publishing the agenda in a timely manner. And third is determining the amount of staff time and county resources that the board would like for county staff to expend on items at the request of a minority of board members that the full board has not yet reviewed. Um, many jurisdictions we found in doing some research, including the counties of Calaveras, Mono, Orange, San Diego, Yolo, and Tuolumne have already established and adopted such documents. They have procedure manuals in place that answer some of uh, the basic questions related to board meetings and agendas. Um, this includes questions related to election powers and duties of the board chairperson, the required timing for placing matters on the agenda, and the use of county resources within board direction. Such a document can also set forth rules of conduct related to meetings, including the flow of board agendas, public comment, and the procedures for holding quasi-judicial public hearings in planning matters. It can also provide rules for other items such as board budget and travel expenditures, appointment of board members to associate boards and commissions, and protocols for resolving meeting disruptions. While the rules contained in these manuals are intended to provide clarity and certainty into how the work of the board gets accomplished, it is important to remember that the rules are not set in stone. They can be modified by an act of the majority of the board at any point to better serve the board. Manuals and policies for three counties that we researched were attached to the board item to give you a sense of what they might contain. Um, and our recommendation today is, is to form an ad hoc committee that would be made up of uh, the board chair, currently Supervisor Cummings, and another appointed board member. This group would meet over the next 60 days, and we are recommending that we return at the board's November 19th meeting with a draft procedures manual for the full board's consideration. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, and take anything else up. Right, I'm gonna open up to the public to see if there's any member of the public here in chambers who'd like to speak to us on this item. Please come forward, you'll have two minutes. I would, thank you. My name is Becky Steinbruner. Um, thank you for fixing the broken links to the um, attachments to the other three counties. So I tried it earlier from the public library and the downloads failed, but it was fixed. I checked it just before I came. So thank you for doing that. I did um, have a little bit of time to read through Mono County's policies and procedures, and I think it serves as a good guideline. First of all, I hope that this committee will reinstate the public's ability to pull items from the consent agenda on your board meeting agendas. There are many things that I see on the consent agenda that should not be there. For example, today, as a member of a public, if I had the ability, I would have pulled item 35, the county's draft emergency response operation plan. Something of that magnitude should not be on the consent agenda. Um, so uh, please reinstate that. The public used to be able to do that, but in a committee headed by CAO Palacios and Supervisor McPherson, that ability was taken away from us. 
please give it back because I have asked board members to pull things and it rarely happens. So the thing I want to point out um, with my limited amount of time, and I'll give this to you from the mono, is um, ensure accountability, monitor the fiscal health of the county. That's a huge problem right now. And I suggest that your board set up a standing committee to review the county's finances regularly and report to the board publicly. I also uh, like the welcoming to the new board members that is included in their policies. And I want to point out that um, they specifically say that you can take action to address public complaints and issues not on the agenda by simply referring members of the public to appropriate staff. That would give public who takes time to come here and find a parking place <laughs> to, uh, to feel like we've been heard. Okay, thank thank you. All right, is there any other member of the public here present who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, we'll go online to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item online. We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for any questions, comments, and further discussion. Um, I guess I'll start with some of my senior colleagues. Yeah, oh, well, I, yeah someone who's chaired the board several times. I, I do think we can benefit from some of the additional um, policies in the uh, around the agenda management that we have. Um, I, I want to ensure that this process preserves the ability of uh, individual board members to place items on the agenda at, in the service of their particular goals or opportunities that they might want in their own districts. Uh, but we also need to recognize um, excuse me, the real impacts of uh, the county council and the CAO and the, the staff. Um, so I look forward to recommendations that come forward from this committee. I think it's a good idea. Supervisor Friend. I, I'm in agreement with Supervisor McPherson. I'd be happy to serve with you, Mr. Chair, if the board was was interested or willing. I, th I think that um, this just helps create one of the things that I noticed when I first came out and, and we tried to change this for when you came out, there really was no onboarding process for new members and it was pretty difficult. There has been one that's been created, but I think having uh, an understanding framework of what the chair is supposed to do, what the board members expectations are um, for new members and the board in general is going to be very helpful just having that set of expectations. So I think it's the right direction. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. <laughs> I would just concur that I think this is a good step in the right direction for uh, having a little bit more guidelines uh, on how to uh, be an effective chair and how the entire board should operate. Um, so, I mean, I'm prepared to move that we create an ad hoc subcommittee uh, to uh, to create a manual to guide how the board conducts its business and to appoint um, you, Mr. Chair, as well as Supervisor Friend to be on that subcommittee and return by November 19th. 2024 with the procedures manual. Before we get a second, I just want to hear from the supervisor Fernandez. I think everybody, I think everybody already said, you know, um, what needs to be said. So, yeah. So, motion by supervisor. Second. Okay. Oh, yeah, so, we have a second from supervisor Fernandez. I'll just make some quick comments. Um, I appreciate um, this coming forward to the board. Um, I share um, similar. Um, concerns that Supervisor McPherson has ex expressed uh, around the ability of board members to put items on the agenda and to get some initial help from staff on some of these items. I have seen in the past where um, when I was on the city council, um, certain members of the city council who wanted to put items on the board were on, onto the agenda were um, prevented from doing so because of some of the policies. And so I just want to make sure that we preserve um, the ability of board members to um, bring things forward to the public and um, be able to, you know, see what the public, how the public feels about moving forward and, and, and investing resources into the policies that we present. And then I guess I'll just also say that there are certain items that you know, we're maybe from our state legislatures that are asking us for, hey, can we get this on your agenda? And it's a, t it's a tight time frame, and it's not that big of a lift. Um, so certain emergency items, um, I think that we should definitely discuss how we're going to move those forward as well. Um, but I'll support this today, and I get and I look forward to working with Supervisor Friend to see how we can make sure that this is something that um, is not going to take away the board's ability to conduct its business and move forward its priorities, um, but also um, you know, really. Um, ensures that we're utilizing resources appropriately. So with that, I'll uh, I'll turn it back to Supervisor. Actually, we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor Hernandez. We can take a roll call vote on the item. 
Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay. With that, I believe we're going to move back to item number one sec. Item number 11, uh, conduct study session on housing for a healthy Santa Cruz strategic framework, adopt resolution to address homelessness in a compassionate, comprehensive manner and take related actions. And with that, I'll uh, invite Randy Morris and Robert Ratner to provide us with that presentation. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Chair Cummings, members of the board. Good to be back in front of you today. It's been a long day. Um, I'm going to make a few introductory comments, and I'm going to turn it over to Robert Ratner, who's going to go through a formal PowerPoint. Um, I just want to remind the board and the community that we're here in front of you under your direction to return to the board every six months to give an update to the board and community on the status of our work in the Housing for Health division run by Dr. Ratner, which is really a countywide in partnership with city and multiple CBOs effort to try to address this uh, growing humanitarian crisis of homelessness. And my introductory comments are we are in the second iteration of a strategic plan that your board approved six months ago, coming for the first six month report on that strategic plan. Every six months, we lift up for you progress we've made in the past six months and propose a slate of priorities for the next six months for your discussion and public comment. I just wanna say as the human services director, I continue to be impressed by how safety net public systems are really a byproduct of federal, state, and local government interaction that are working together and in alignment, both in policy and funding. And I think the efforts in the United States of America to align federal, state, and local government is not working that well. And we only have control over what we do locally, but I feel responsible to share with you some of the big activities that have occurred in the last six months at the federal and state level, just to put in context kind of the environment we're working in. So number one, probably well known, but it ties to one of the recommended actions today, which is a resolution because literally the Supreme Court of the United States at their end of their cycle in June overturned a West Coast federal court rule, Martin versus Boise, which led to a lot of advocates filing injunctions in the West Coast federal uh, court systems, stopping the clearing of encampments. And that was overturned by the Supreme Court of the United States. The six conservative justice voted to overturn it and the three progressive justices voted to uphold it, saying it is cruel and unusual punishment to move people who are unsheltered around without having some services for them. This is a very complicated issue, but it has opened a big door to look at how encampment responses occur in the West Coast that had been somewhat paralyzed under that former West Coast Supreme Court ruling in District 9. This leads to the second big action that occurred since we've been in front of you, and that is the state. Our governor, Governor Gavin Newsom, who is a very powerful orator, um, very effective politician, and gets in front of the media quite a bit, has used this opportunity to submit an executive order directing state property like Caltrans property to clear encampments, which leads to the narrative he has been creating and continues to um, push that he has given local government enough money to have a place to put people who are in encampments. And this is now a local accountability problem. I feel it's my responsibility to walk a delicate line to say my 30 years in public safety net services, this is the biggest disconnect in a state elected official speaking to what I see on the ground. I do not see that we have enough money. I do not see that we have sustainable money. And I do not see that we have enough services to move people around if we just clear encampments. So there is a lot happening in the way the Supreme Court has ruled and how our governor is now messaging what local government should do. And there's an opportunity for you as our board to weigh in on this. And we've had put a resolution in front of you to consider our thinking on it. And I want to end with the biggest local issue that played out, which I think gets a little closer and more in our control. And that is we are responsible as the Housing for Health Division to administer the yearly point in time count. Two, two cycles ago, the point in time count for the first time ever showed a pretty dramatic reduction in the number of people who are unsheltered during that one day count. There was a lot of criticism of the process. It was in the middle of atmospheric rivers. There was questions about how the count was conducted. 
and it is a mandated system we have to use in a time frame we have to follow. So we recognize the limits of that count. But I think two big things that come out of the point in time count that was um, made public recently since we were last in front of you. Number one, it somewhat affirms that the progress we are making here in Santa Cruz County under your board support and direction and our work in housing for health and in partnership with cities and the uh, continuum of care, the progress we have made has sustained. So there was a big shift in the number of people who were unhoused in our community two years ago and affirmed this last year. However, we unfortunately continue to see a profound inequity. There has been a large investment in this community well before my time in North County services. And I think there is a correlation to why we're seeing a reduction in the number of unhoused in the Northern part of the county. And there's been a long history of less investment in services in South County. And there is a profound and disturbing increase in the number of unsheltered in South County. So in closing, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Ratner, I wanna take a minute to appreciate both my boss, our CAO Carlos, Robert, our Housing for Health Director, who I believe bring to the table a methodical, thoughtful, and purposeful approach to a complex issue that I believe is the way to move forward and reacting to legal rulings and political comments from the state to just move people around, I think is not good government and I think it's inhumane. And I hope that you'll consider and ask us hard questions about the resolution we have in front of you to continue the thoughtful, purposeful work we are doing that is making a difference. And lastly, thank you to the board for supporting our recommendation to invest a significant amount of money in South County to continue to try to get at the issue that we need to get ahead of. And we have some details that Robert will share about the work we're doing in South County specifically to address the growing numbers of unshuttled South County. So I hope those introductory comments are helpful. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ratner, who's gonna go through a formal presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Randy, and thank you, members of the board. As Randy said, this is a six-month update pattern that we've had, and this is our seventh actual update. We're providing an update on the framework that the board adopted in early 2023. Bring up the slides. Um, I'm going the next one. Thanks. Is this working? Oh, all right. Beautiful. So this is uh, what I plan to cover my presentation. I'm gonna provide a little bit more detail on the trends and the point in time count and speak a little bit more to that, how we're doing with the goals we have in the framework that the board adopted last year, an update on the six month goals that we established for the work in our division with our partners. And then the three areas where I really wanted to highlight today is, as Randy articulated, uh, the, the phrase encampment resolution, how do we work together to support people who are living without shelter and address the impacts that has on their lives and the lives of other members in the community. And as many of the members of the board and public know that there are a lot of reforms in behavioral health care in California recently, and our division is really committed to working closely with behavioral health care to take advantage of new funding opportunities and some of those fairly significant changes in policy. And then wanted to wrap up with talking about what we're doing in South County, going back to Randy's point about needing to make sure we invest strategically countywide and looking at the data we have on those trends. And the sum and theme of the presentation I wanted to give today is embedded in this quote on the bottom of the slide, success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. I think there's a tendency where we're talking about such a difficult issue where so many people are struggling and suffering without stable housing to respond in dramatic um, ways and to make quick changes and approach. And I try to want, I want to make the case today that the idea of having a framework and sticking to specific goals and a structure over time is what results in positive change. And I think we're starting to see that. I'm going to make the case to all of you that sustaining our efforts, as well as making commitments of resources to address the needs of specific populations is how we see results. So the point in time count, I think many people uh, that I've interacted with I um, know that it's an imperfect method, but it is a method that we implement according to federal guidelines. We in Santa Cruz County conduct the count every year, and most other jurisdictions only do it every two years. We did that intentionally so we could do a better job of creating more consistency from year to year in the count, doing it the same way with essentially the same process and organization and volunteers as much as possible so that when we see trends, we can say, okay, there's there's something there in the trends. 
important to remember that we know it's an undercount. There's a lot of academic research that shows the point in time, which is one day um, in a year, is an underestimate of the people experiencing homelessness. It excludes a lot of people who are in jails and hospitals and institutions that if they weren't in those beds that night would be on the streets. And we know from research studies that people who are on the streets get missed, even with the best intentions of effort. So we know it's an undercount, but it's a consistent undercount. So what this slide shows is the point in time count over time is the blue line. And you can see uh, in 2021 or late November 2020 is when our division got created. And we're starting to see the trend line down in the point in time count. I think that's because the board and community members are really building a structure around working together to address this issue and investing in ways that the county had not before. And folks often are skeptical of what that count shows. So I look at, okay, what's our data telling us about our programs? And the orange line below shows the number of people, HMIS stands for the Homeless Management Information System, data of our housing and services programs. So as the, you can see the point time counts going down and the data on our services shows more people are exiting to permanent housing. So to me that indicates, okay, there's some alignment there in the numbers. Uh, our programs are performing and getting more people into housing and our numbers are going down. To further elaborate on this, this shows the trend line in uh, HMIS data over time from 2015 when we first started using our current data system to 2024 and how many people are exiting from our programs that use this data system every year into permanent housing. So the blue line is the total number of exits. So 2024, we're obviously not done with 2024. So this is just a snapshot of where we are today. And you can see that the number of exits from programs in 2024 already exceeds any prior year. And the orange line is the percentage of people who exit to permanent housing. So in general, we're serving more people in our system and a higher percentage are exiting to permanent housing, which is the trend that we wanna have since the first framework. And so small incremental changes that we're doing collectively are getting results. One of the things that Randy alluded to is in our point in time count process, we get estimates on the number of people experiencing homelessness um, generally and unsheltered people specifically. And this shows the trend line by jurisdiction. So the blue line is the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, Watsonville is the orange line. Uh, the gray is the unincorporated areas of the county. And other is the two smaller city jurisdictions, Capitola, Scotts Valley, and then County Office of Education. So there's a dramatic shift in the past few years of reductions in homelessness in the northern part of the county in the city of Santa Cruz and increases in Watsonville. And we've also seen some increases in the smaller cities, in the school district data, and in unincorporated areas. So I think to me, this speaks to where we invest collective energy, we can see results. So we need to balance out those investments countywide to see results consistently countywide. This slide talks about accomplishments out of 44 goals we had in our last six month process. I want to just highlight some of the things that stood out for myself and some of our staff. Uh, we secured and we are fortunate because not every jurisdiction secured their HAP5 funding. There's been a lot of back and forth with the state. This is a state block grant to address homelessness that comes to local continuum of cares and to counties. We just got word that we're approved. Our plan was accepted. Uh, we had a fair amount of back and forth, but that, that's a big deal in my mind. We launched two groups, one for youth who had experience with living without housing in our community, as well as a general population. So we launched those groups. We're getting feedback from them on how to improve, again, small incremental steps. If they give us suggestions, we need to listen to them and hear how we can make our system better. We have two low barrier navigation center projects, which is a state fancy term for shelter with intensive services that really are focused on getting people into housing. We selected a vendor to help build those out quickly, one project in Watsonville and one in our Unicord area in Live Oak. We have a really significant partnership with the Central California Alliance for Health, and um, they've invested tremendously in more supportive housing, and it's made a huge difference in our community. They've also really worked closely with us to be strategic about how we invest in new Medi-Cal dollars in services. So we're working together to make that better. Point in time count, we just went through that and finished the reporting process. 
We made a shift in how we approach coordinated entry. And if you're struggling with a housing issue, historically, our community hasn't partnered strongly with 211 and United Way. We've made an intentional investment to try to make it easier for people to know who to call and where to go if you're struggling with housing. And we're committed to working with United Way and 211 to make sure they have up-to-date information and data. That's going to require everybody in this room and people maybe who are listening and many others to make sure we get up-to-date information in one location so it's easier for people to know where to go for help. Later on, I'm going to talk about we have gaps, even though the, we know that housing is the number one reason that people call 211. And there's gaps in the data and the issues that are coming up for folks who are struggling with housing. And then we've had significant lease-ups of supportive housing and other permanent housing over the past six months. And that's fundamentally what drives our success, is if we have more affordable housing units, more supportive housing units, that's where I see the most data positive trends, is when we get those new chunks of units and new vouchers, we see the biggest drops in the number of people experiencing homelessness. So how are we doing on our framework goals? As a reminder, uh, when we updated our framework for this three-year period for 2024 to 2027, we decided to align with national standards around what HUD defines, Housing and Urban Development defines as high-performing communities. So who doesn't want to be a high-performing community, right? I, I like to be high-performing in whatever I do. So there are four, um, actually five goals on here, but four come from HUD. So reducing the length of time that people are experiencing homelessness. I was shocked when we actually looked at this data in our system, how long people experience homelessness in our community before they actually get into housing. Um, it's currently at 2.5 years, which is a 6% reduction from the prior year. And our goal is to get that down 10%. That's the HUD goal every year. So reduce the percentage of people that we help to get back into housing that return to homelessness. Our data showed 8% of people that were in our system in the prior federal fiscal year ended up returning to homelessness. Uh, we really want to get that down below 5%, which is the national standard, or a 20% reduction from year to year. HUD wants us to do a better job of making sure our programs capture data in one system. So we're making progress there. The threshold is 80% of the programs we identify in the community that serve people at risk of or experiencing homelessness or putting data into the HMIS system. We made huge inroads with the VA. We're getting VA data in our system, and that took a lot of time and a lot of work from a lot of people, um, both on our team and the VA. So much appreciation to them to get that info into our system. And then uh, number four, I think, is the one that's probably the uh, most essential one to highlight is that trying to close the gap between the number of people who don't have shelter and our ability to connect with them and get them on a road to stable housing. We just don't have enough provider capacity um, built out in our system yet to reach everyone who's unsheltered. So the goal that HUD sets is over the course of a one-year period, look at your point in time count data, how many people are unsheltered, so close to 1,800 at the look back period. And the standard is over that year, but that's one day, over one year, can you get all those people into some kind of housing program? So we've got a big gap there. And connecting with those folks who don't have shelter and getting them into a housing program, that's a combination of needing more housing programs, because if you don't have a lot of them, there's nothing to get people into. But we also need people out there building relationships and connecting with folks and getting on the path to housing. And then the last item in our framework is really pushing that we need to collectively in all of our jurisdictions hit our very low income and people experiencing homelessness are in this category called deeply low income, which isn't even tracked with the regional housing needs allocation goals. But we'll report on that in the next six month period because none of the jurisdictions have reported out yet on their housing goals. As a reminder, uh, we have the city of Santa Cruz who hit their arena goals and all their income categories last eight year arena cycle, and they're also a designated pro housing community. So to the extent that every jurisdiction in this community moves in that direction, we're gonna see more progress on housing and homelessness. So that's something our office continues to work on uh, with colleagues around the county. Uh, what are we gonna work on in the next six months? Uh, construction delays, I think you all have heard this before. Unfortunately, we have some delays with our planned low barrier navigation centers. I'm really hopeful that at least two of the three of them, we will have broken ground and see progress. Uh, the two, one in Watsonville and the Baver Health Bridge housing project in Live Oak area, they involve modular construction. So one of those projects, the modular part of it, that construction is happening, but the actual work on site hasn't started yet, but should happen in the next month or so. 
Earlier today, you had a presentation on CORE, and I wanted to highlight and remind the board about your commitment to serving South County and that decision-making process of carving out funding for supporting shelter countywide, so making sure we have county shelter funding in South County. But we also set aside a half a million dollars in the next CORE cycle for an intensive homelessness prevention program focused on South County, where we're seeing a rise in homelessness. So we're going to use our Housing for a Vendor Pool process to solicit the contractor who will likely have partners helping them. Um, and that contract will start in July of next fiscal year. We are starting an outreach project in the unincorporated areas of the county. We've never had that before, as far as I've heard. Um, Housing Matters was selected as the vendor. We're going to work with our sheriff and other folks who come into contact with people in unincorporated areas to get that connection. Uh, mentioned Cal AIM, Medi-Cal reform, and working with the Alliance, that is really critical. We've been doing a fair amount of work. It's painstaking work to try to get our data system to match the Medi-Cal world system so that providers who use our data system can also bill for those services. So I'm hoping by next six month update, uh, we'll be able to tell you, yes, it's happening and our providers will hopefully see the administrative benefits of that. We've got new housing that's coming online. It's really exciting um, in the next six month period. And some of those are home key projects that we've been talking about that are actually gonna come online within the next six months. Uh, we're going to apply for additional home key funding through Proposition 1, which was a ballot measure related to behavioral health, and keep the home key projects we have in the construction phase moving forward. And then we have a process that HUD has us go through every year to renew grants that a lot of our providers get from HUD to address homelessness. And we're going to go after as much new money as we can. And then partnering with behavioral health care on a lot of the statewide reform. I got a slide on that a little bit later. Um, this is a busy slide on encampment resolution, kind of walk through it a little bit. Um, Randy mentioned these two fairly, not fairly, so very significant changes in law and in practice. The U.S. Supreme Court decision and the grants pass case overturned a, a longstanding legal precedent around how Western region jurisdictions in the U.S. approach encampments. And the governor issued an executive order related to encampments and state agencies doing more to actively address concerns related to encampments. After the order was issued, the staff that work under Governor Newsom and the executive branch uh, made some clarifying statements about what was intended by the governor's message. And I included them here on the slide and highlighted some state departments should urgently and humanely address encampments on state property. Um, and then the other point, local jurisdictions should adopt local policies and prioritization criteria to address encampments. We have been doing that work. The board directed the county to develop for the unincorporated areas a collaborative policy and procedure for addressing encampments in the unincorporated area. So um, the resolution before you is really echoing what the governor wants us to do is to treat these issues urgently and humanely, and also to develop our own prioritization and focus and use money in strategic ways to prioritize serving unsheltered people. Um, and the right side of the slide um, describes um, what the order is not to do, it should say. Um, immediately clear encampments without being thoughtful, make living without shelter a crime, um, that's not what the governor intended. And I think there are people around the state who have interpreted the order in that fashion. And the governor's staff had made it clear that was not what was intended. And so what we're proposing to staff is um, adopting a resolution, in some ways restating the principles of our framework that we're about helping people get on a path to permanent housing and sticking with that steady step-by-step -step course and trying to bring in as much money as we can from state, federal, and local sources to address the issue and really focusing on that coordination and partnership. Um, and then behavioral health, I think many of you know, um, and many listening know there's been a lot of change around behavioral health color policy in California. I refer to it as reform flooding. There's so much change happening all at once, it's really difficult to tease out you know, how, to, how to do all this in a thoughtful, effective way. And I think us in human services who are really partnering to help people get on a path to housing, given the prevalence of mental health and substance use issues among people who are struggling with housing, we really need to make it a focus of our division to deepen our relationship with behavioral health care. 
care staff and service providers, and we're really committing to that today and wanted to say that out loud to you all. Um, the other things to be mindful of is there's a lot of language around the value of some of the changes in Bayer Healthcare. However, the, the increased funding is really one-time funding to create new facilities, but there has not been an increase in funding to expand ongoing services. It's really critical to keep that in mind. So if we build something, we have to be sure we can run it because we can't build stuff and then um, spend all that time and effort and not be able to run it. So some of the big issues coming are the CARE Act, which we have to implement in December in partnership with Behavioral Health Care, SB 43, changes to conservatorship, expanding the number of people who can be in treatment on a time-limited involuntary basis, um, and then working on the Medi-Cal reform and billing. Uh, and then so this slide lists some of the other things we're working on. The low barrier navigation centers, more supportive housing units. Uh, we have a behavioral health care specific housing fund. We're working to support behavioral health care in addressing some facility issues with some other licensed facilities. We were able to get some one-time money to help address those physical plant needs. Linking our housing services more with behavioral health care providers, I think is really critical around that connection piece trying to go after the money, the Prop 1 housing money and the residential treatment funding. Got some very good news that you'll all hear about in a month, but we got a grant as part of the Kelly reform to really work on data sharing to better understand the needs across our public system silos, healthcare, behavioral health, housing. So I'm really excited that we've got these additional resources over the next six months to really make some progress on data sharing. And then coordinating care. Um, we have too many situations that come to my attention where we have one person who has four providers working with them, and we have thousands that have no provider working with them. So we really need to have a better understanding of how to distribute those service resources in ways that really touch more people and positive quality um, service packages. And then uh, wrapping up, what are we doing in South County? Well, the trend line in the pit count showed that we need to do more work there. And one of the, the biggest significant projects is this partnership with Monterey County, the Pajaro River Flood Management Agency. We secured encampment resolution funds. We also got a commitment of funding from the local managed care plan, set up a new low barrier shelter in Watsonville and new intensive services for people who are living in encampments. And it has taken staff about a year and a half to raise up to $10 million of funding to get this project together. Um, and I'm very excited that we got to this moment. I'm looking forward to working with our colleagues in Watsonville to get that project launched and get the services started. And really appreciate all the partners that are helping to make that work. That site is not getting developed as fast as we like, would like. And one of our nonprofit partners, uh, Association of Faith Communities, is able and willing to expand their rotating face shelter and safe parking program into South County, uh, not just in the short term, but long term. So we're partnering with them to get that expansion to happen. So that there is some shelter and safe parking programs there. I was in a meeting recently where folks in Watsonville seem not to know we have permanent supportive housing already in Watsonville. We have a lot of projects in Watsonville that are permanent supportive housing, and we've got more coming online, and we're always trying to make those better. We've got a home key youth transitional housing project on Freedom Boulevard. We just got the contract from the state. So we're going to get the construction started on that. And we already have core funded programs in South County. It's one of the largest core funded programs with the Community Action Board. It's a homelessness prevention program with the school district. I mentioned we have the core funding uh, slated for the next fiscal year. And then uh, other projects we're working on, um, Supervisor Hernandez um, is really pushing us all to work together to get at least $5 million into the Watsonville South County area for new affordable housing. And I'm down. And uh, we actually have an opportunity right now with HUD. There's a $5 million grant available. We have to pick one project to send up to the state and we have a process to get local applications in. So I'd love to see a project proposed from South County that we can look at and maybe pitch onto HUD and there is funding available. So I think that's a realistic goal to work with the city to get in at least $5 million for new housing projects. And that is um, close to the end, sorry. Uh, theme of little changes. So without a lot of new money, what can we do? Um, just some examples of what we've done. We changed our coordinated entry approach, moving from just assessing people and then putting them on a list to we're assessing people to do something to help them right now focusing on quality over quantity, being realistic when we tell people what we have to offer. 
we only refer about 150 to 200 people into permanent housing programs because that's the resource turnover and amount we typically have. So we tell people that now. We don't want to give people false hope. So we've got to then get people directed to other resources. We need to train up our staff um, and help them understand the options that people have who are struggling with housing. We're doing more and more of that, more data sharing. And then we have this focus on really listening on how we can do every little thing we can to make our efforts better. We're far from perfect. I make mistakes, our team makes mistakes, but we're all very committed to getting better so that we can get better results for our community. And then one thing that I'm really excited about that um, the statewide study on homelessness said a lot of people experiencing homelessness just need one time, they needed just $5,000 roughly on average, I think statewide to prevent loss of housing. And many people said they need that amount of money just to get the security deposit. We spent a lot of time to get money in one big pot that we could say, okay, it's here, you can access it. It's made a huge difference. We've helped hundreds of families and individuals get through that security deposit furniture um, hump. And we have a partnership with the Community Foundation. So if people wanna donate to add into that pool, we've gotten $55,000 in private donations so far. It is a really simple thing, helping people with one-time money to address a housing barrier. It works, we just need to keep the money coming to ensure we have enough to meet the demand. We have four to five requests a day for funding. And at the pace we're going through right now, we're gonna run out of money um, in December with the current grants we've rated together. So there's a clear need for that one-time assistance. We know it makes a big difference. Um, with that, I will end. The two major things that we're asking for board action is uh, have us come back in six months. I hope next time I'll, I'll bring some people who are less academic and can tell some real human stories about how our work impacts people's lives and then the resolution uh, that we're recommending that you all consider for adoption. Uh, open to questions, comments. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and first open up to the members of the public to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. If so, you'll have two minutes. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I always appreciate the presentations that these two gentlemen give. We're very lucky to have them. You're on staff, they're perfect. And I appreciate all your work. Um, some questions I have is, um, I remember your board approving, I think it was 36 pallet shelters a couple of years ago. And when I checked in, um, I think it was you, Supervisor Koenig, that said the county had not decided where to place them yet. What is the status of that approval? Because your board did approve that, um, that housing pallet shelters. Um, I'd also like to, again, point out that the county received 12 new, um, very nice trailers during COVID that were used to shelter the transition, transition age youth during COVID. They were for a while at the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Center on Old Santa Day Road, then they got moved to the Lower Cabrillo College campus, and then the COVID isolation ended, and they disappeared. But Parks got them. Parks got them all. And there are three that still to this day are sitting empty, empty up at the Burt Scott Estate on Freedom Boulevard. That shouldn't be. These are available. Why aren't they being used? I'd like to see um, high priority given to veterans. I think we owe it very much to these men and women who have served our country and they're out on the streets with PTSD, drug addiction, and getting a stable place to live would go great lengths to help them. The Veterans Village is a wonderful start, but I'd like to see more of that and to see, to know that the county is giving veterans priority. I would also like to ask the point in time counts to go into the county parks, I know, and state parks. I, I, I walk in there and I'm seeing a lot more um, encampments in those areas. Thank you. Thank you. To any other member of the public present who would like to speak to us on this item? I'm seeing none, I'll see if there's anyone online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we have speakers online. Carol, your microphone's now available. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Carol Polhamus. I was there in person, but I couldn't stay. Sorry. I'm speaking today on behalf of Westside Neighbors, which is a large neighborhood group organized in response to the negative impacts people have experienced related to people living in vehicles and encampments in our neighborhoods. We have, we really appreciate the presentation, but I do have questions also. Um, in 2020, the grand jury called for a safe spaces parking and better use of underutilized publicly owned facilities, including juvenile hall. In 2021, your board expressed a goal to examine underutilized facilities. Did that ever happen? In 2021, the board unanimously voted that each supervisor would designate a space in his district for safe spaces, parking and shelter. Has that happened? The city has stood up safe spaces parking areas, but the county has not. Instead, providing funding to the AFC, which provides limited overnight parking, and that's good, but it's not low barrier. It requires insurance and registration to park. Our group was disappointed to recently learn that 701 Ocean was rejected as overflow for the city's safe spaces parking. Why? Were any other alternatives proposed? 46% of the unhoused people in our county live in vehicles. Permanent housing is an aspirational goal, one not attainable in the near future. Our Section 8 waiting list is over 9,800 people and the wait list is closed. At the rate we are bringing affordable housing units online, it will be more than 10 years before we can house those people who are already eligible, not to mention those who haven't applied yet. In the interim, we very much need safe spaces, vehicle parking areas and shelter to improve people's lives now. Those in need require shelter and services. Neighborhoods are tired of experience, experiencing the consequences of inaction. Please step up and provide more safe spaces parking. Thank you. Tim, your microphone's now available. Hello, thank you so much again. One point I wanna make um, here in all this in uh, regards to uh, my guardianship over my mother, and now I'm no longer her guardian. That's a long story. I don't like that. But uh, for my mother, she's lucky to have a son that has uh, resources and ability to advocate for her, okay? That has money. A lot of other folks, they don't. So, um, so I could see where, you know, the programs that are being talked about here are, are of extreme value, you know, probably, you know, for just a guardianship situation, I, I could see how a lot of folks could end up homeless because, uh, dealing with the guardianship, it was the core processes and everything behind it are so enormously complicated and just seeing all that, I could see how a lot of lower middle income people can end up homeless and on our streets. So anyways, I'm very supportive of everything that you're doing here. And I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you very much. I'm all bringing it back to the board to see if there's any board members for, with questions or comments. I'll start with Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, well, certainly it does seem that uh, Dr. Ratner and uh, Director Morris, who've done a great job of taking those small actions every day that add up to success. Uh, and it's fantastic to see the trend lines moving in the right direction. Um, I just hope, I, I wish that we could get more of uh, these current investments we're making, like the behavioral health bridge housing on SoCal or the Watsonville um, Low Barrier Navigation Center up uh, before the next pick count so that we could see even more great progress. But it sounds like that'll probably happen. Uh, a little bit too late to see any significant impacts from those programs. Um, and then, of course, uh, we, you know, because we were talking about CORE earlier today, I think you, I, I was just curious if you could comment. You did mention a little bit about some of the, the programs we could fund in South County with some of that money. Um, how do you see that $1.5 million uh, coming into play and uh, improving our network of, of services on this issue? And, it, you know, to the... Uh, Public comment, is there any opportunity for more safe parking spaces with uh, some of that funding? Yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, regarding the core investments, uh, we set aside $1.5 million for affordable housing and shelter for the next three year period. 
half a million specifically for homeless prevention in South County. And what we're planning to include in that solicitation is uh, that, that prevention package includes legal assistance, one-time financial assistance, which I alluded to, and then services to help people get connected to the resources that are jeopardizing their current housing situation in some way. And the other million dollars we're planning to invest in shelter and safe parking programs um, countywide. So it'll be a mix of, uh, and it will depend somewhat on what happens with the state funding, trying to close gaps in existing programs and looking at opportunities for expansion. One of the things that's important to me is finding ways we can leverage some of those dollars because those are local county funds. So if we can find ways to pair that with matching federal dollars, we want to do that as much as possible to expand the pot and expand the programming countywide. Great, thank you. Supervisor Friend. I just want to take a moment to really recognize the amount of investment in South County that's been happening. This isn't a given and this hasn't been the historic norm and, and the fact that uh, the county and the board and in particular you, Dr. Ratner and, and you, Mr. Mor Director Morris have really focused on it is is important. Uh, because it's been a historically underinvested area and it, and it has uh, equal to not greater issues uh, to North County. Um, I have sort of a, a completely random question, which was the detail level of this report. You know, serving as the chair of CSAC, I recognize how many mandates are put upon your team and, and just compliance and that kind of stuff. Um, how much time and effort do you put into these six month reports? I mean, I ask because I mean, I need you doing the work more than I need you doing the reports. And if this is something that is taking up a lot of time, it's just something if it should be yearly, I don't, I don't know. But I just was listening to this thinking that you had to have spent hours upon hours getting the data and stuff. And I want to make sure that the board is prioritizing um, you delivering services than you delivering um, six month reports. So I just wanted to bring that up. If it, this was, if six months is fine, then six months is fine. But if it's a year, it's a discussion that I think that we should have as a board. I, I want to just jump in and say one thing and then turn it back to Dr. Ratner because I know how many hours he puts into this. Um, I have the responsibility of overseeing a $192 million <clears throat> department. And as complex as it is to address poverty and abuse and low-income people being in home with multiple federal and state audits, the responsibilities to run all other divisions in HSD are actually much simpler because the funding from the feds, the funding from the state, and the audit lines and the reporting lines are much cleaner and simpler. So I just want to say from where the seat I'm in, I see two worlds. One that is the result of 50, 60 years of lawsuits and federal and state action. There's a lot of clarity and it leads to some much more simple reporting. The second comment I want to make is I'm going to choose to piggyback on my introductory comments. We do have a governor who consistently messages we are lacking transparency and accountability. And he is knowingly or he inherited a state system that funds multiple programs from multiple different departments, all of which require multiple reports, which yeah. keep us completely buried in work. And we are trying to find the sweet spot between not underreporting to your board in the community, but aligning with this messaging that we're not doing what we're being asked to do, which comes directly from state mandates, which are a dizzying maze of activity. So with that said, I'll let Robert speak for himself, but he does spend countless hours trying to be transparent and accountable given what he's being directed to do from this complicated maze of funding we deal with. Look, I'm not trying to reduce that. I mean, the, the transparency, I'm just trying to say that when I've testified on behalf of CSAC to the state, I have counties telling me that half of their staff time is spent just on compliance for these grant activities and reporting activities, half. And so I, I don't need to be adding to that, right? We need to deliver services. So if this is a lot of work, we did this actually with cannabis. Cannabis was coming on a quarterly and we just said that, you know, that this work is important, but it doesn't need to come to us all the time, or it could be a minimum of X number of times a year or once a year with additional as needed. I, I'm just throwing this out there. This is not a coordinated conversation. I didn't talk to you about this in advance. It literally just came organically from listening to the detail that you're providing and throwing it out there, Dr. Rodner. Anything that reduces the amount of time I and our staff spend on administrative details is much appreciated. Okay. Is a quick answer. That is, I mean, yeah, Dr. Ratner, JD, with that lawyer answer. Um, but that's, I mean, I think that the board should consider maybe making this a once a year with additional as needed reports because there will be times I think that things need to come forward to us, but just felt like a lot of time and effort for these kinds of things. I'll leave it to my colleagues that will be, will be here. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Radner and uh, Director Randy Morse of, of Human Services and our CEO, Carlos Palacios, for their uh, dedication to tracking, uh, tackling this, what's arguably the certainly one of the most uh, challenging problems we have here in the county and throughout the state of California. And for many years, there's been a sentiment in the community that our county was ignoring the problem. We're far from it. As a matter of fact, we're a leader in it. Uh, and I think it is clear now with these in, uh, increasing investments that we, in fact, are leading the effort to uh, address this problem with the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville in particular. Uh, and also, I want to just say that thanks to, and you have mentioned some of our uh, county partnerships with uh, some community organizations, Housing Matters, the Veterans Groups, United Way, Community Foundation, and others on the ground organizations. And Dr. Radford is not going to like this, but uh, he is a gem that we have here in Santa Cruz County. And I, when I was at CSAC as a director and he gave a presentation, people listened because he said, you know, we can't promise what we don't have and can't afford. And people say, yeah, that's pretty simple. And I don't think the governor's office has got to that point that they think we have all this money that we do not have where it's it's not allocated correctly, as uh, Supervisor Friend indicated as well. Um, but um, I think we need to get it. I hope we can get a touch of realism uh, up in the state to what a huge problem this is. And for all these accomplishments, I just looked at a couple of these. Um, we amazingly have gotten these two $22 million grants, one for, uh, what, three permanent housing uh, for uh, 74 households, another for uh, 22 million for this uh, this three centers, one in Watsonville for 88 beds. I mean, if 74 and 82, and we have a homeless population of 2,000 plus. I mean, we got to get real of how big this problem is, and it's not. We don't have enough to cover it, and neither does anybody else in this state as we sit. Now, uh, it's going to take. A huge amount of uh, resource, financial resources. Um, and if we can just cut the red tape and get down to doing the job of building more homes for people to get to, uh, that's what we need to be. It's, I think that's something like maybe Dr. Ratner would even say, you know, just do what you can do with what you have. And uh, we have done a tremendous amount of work with what we have. And I, I think um, that... Uh, we just need a touch of realism, if I repeat that again, of what we can do with what we have and let the the uh, the state know this is what we're doing with what we have. And it's quite significant and really a very great accomplishment, I think. So um, I just uh, think that uh, this is the huge challenge that we have and it's very costly. And we just have to get a better grip of how much it is costing to get people uh, off the streets and into homes. Uh, I don't think the state in particular has a real grasp of how big a problem that is. And they they put it on the counties because we're their uh, local governing agents, so to speak. Um, we'll do what we can with what we have. And because we have Dr. Ratner and Randy Morris, uh, we're doing better than just about everybody else in this state. So thank you very much. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, um, I agree with the uh, supervisor friend about hey, we don't need to do this every every three months or six months. But this one in particular, I think, is important because it addresses issues that have arise, ar arisen in South County with the pit counts and some of the issues that we're facing over there in South County. So um, I do commend you for the presentation. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, hopefully we can. I look, well, I look forward to working with and collaborating with the city of Watson, though, on these issues, um, especially now that Pro Proposition One's being rolled out and funded, uh, we got to have those discussions with them. And I think they're willing to do that after the session you have with them, the homeless one-on-one session with, their, with them. I think hopefully they, we can meet up after that and see if uh, we can continue to work together. Yeah, well. First, I want to start by thanking you all for the presentation and for all the hard work that's been done to help us address homelessness. I know people, many people want to see the problem disappear overnight, but it's something that's going to take time because there's a lot of different factors that are contributing to homelessness within our community. Um, I just wanted to confirm something that I saw on the screen. Is that 
over 2,000 people exiting from programs into permanent housing this year. There's a graph that was up. Great question. That was the total number that exited programs, but only about 45% exited to permanent housing. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to double check that. Um, and um, so, yeah, again, just want to express my my support for all the efforts and also, again, share the same um, concerns with my colleagues about investing in South County and making sure that those investments are resulting in helping people stay in their homes and um, or get off the street and into housing. Uh, one quick question on that topic as well is I'm just wondering who's for the assistance that you were speaking to. I'm just wondering, is there an income requirement for that assistance or is that assistance available to anyone who may be at risk of losing their housing? Yeah, the current uh, housing assistance fund we have is tied into the agencies that use our data system. So by virtue of that, there's not a formal income cutoff, but it tends to be people at 30% of the area median income or below, people who are kind of around the Medi-Cal eligibility income level or the bulk of the people we serve, but there's no formal cutoff. Got it. Okay. I just, I wanted to double check that because there are people who because rent is so expensive in this community, they can be above that income level and still paying over the 30% for their housing. And then, for example, the apartment I used to live in, it just got recently sold and everybody was told they had to get out. And a lot of those people will be faced with the fact that, you know, the deposit that they get back, maybe a few hundred dollars. And in order to get in a new house, they may need, you know, a thousand plus to match their first month's rent in order to get in those homes. And that can be a challenge. So just wanted to make sure that, you know, we're acknowledging that there are people above those income levels that may still need that assistance in order to not end up in homelessness in our community. And then finally, I just want to address something that is uh, actually before I do that, I did also just want to thank you all for the resolution that's being brought forward. Um, there are many people who are sending emails to my office. I'm sure other folks received emails as well related to the Supreme Court's decision and then their concern that the county was going to stop investing in homelessness and instead um, resort to criminalizing folks. And so I think this re this resolution really reflects the fact that we do want to continue this amazing work that we've been able to achieve um, and continue to ensure that we're um, approaching homelessness in a compassionate way and really trying to get people off the streets and in the housing. And so just want to appreciate that. And then the last thing that I think um, which has been brought up in the media recently, and I know that the city of Santa Cruz is addressing today, it's related to homelessness, so I think it's not in violation of this, but, you know, the, um, the situation where um, officers from the city of Hanford actually had um, picked up a person who was experiencing homelessness off the street and without their consent dropped them off in uh, the city of Santa Cruz. At one point, they attempted to drop them off at Ross parking lot, and ultimately they ended up dropping them off at the armory. But just really want to express my condemnation of that behavior because that is a violation of people's human rights. Um, homelessness is not a crime. And for someone who's experiencing homelessness, um, you know, for them to be not arrested for violating a crime, but to be, you know, taken by people who are sworn officers and taken away from their community and dropped off somewhere completely different. Um, it's just completely unacceptable. And in a time when we're trying to, you know, repair relationships between public safety officers and community members, this just further um, erodes that ability for us to, you know, um, have good relationships between law enforcement and our community members. And so I'm not, I don't want to recommend any action today, but I think it's worth us having conversations, especially with our um, state elected officials around what can be done to address this kind of behavior. Because there was also an article where this happened in L.A. earlier this year. And I know that the L.A. Board of Supervisors and City Council asked for the attorney general to get involved. So it may be worth us reaching out to those offices to understand this behavior and, and what kind of laws there are around prohibiting this behavior, because with the governor's action to um, you know, push people to push jurisdictions um, towards breaking up encampments. Um, it would be sad to see this kind of behavior continuing to occur, especially because it will impact um, municipalities that are really trying to get people housed versus those that don't want to do anything to get people housed. And so look forward to having those conversations with staff and um, just urge us to reach out to our state elected officials to push them to try to move um, state legislation forward to address this issue. And so with that, um, I guess the last thing I'd ask for um, when we have a motion come before is maybe that we send a, a letter to the governor's office, because I know they were um, earlier this summer, they said, you know, they expect jurisdictions to do more. And my hope is that we can send a letter to the governor's office through the chair 
updating them on the progress that we've been making on homelessness and advocating for more funding. And so that's the only additional direction I'd like to ask um, as we move forward. All right, I'll move the recommended actions with a change of uh, turning in six months to 12 months unless additional media, additional updates are needed and add the additional direction of an update to the governor um, in a letter that hopefully doesn't get him to have a press conference here updating <laughs> on the things that we're doing so carefully worded from the chair. <laughs> I'll second it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Cummings. Um, I'll, uh, is there any further questions or comments? Seeing none, or do you have a I was going to say, if emergencies arise or we need to come back. That's why I said with as okay. yeah additional as needed. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right, I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Which brings us to our last item on the agenda. And thank you all again for your update and for all your hard work. Um, last item on our agenda which is item number 13, consider cannabis cultivation, canopy expansion options and take related actions. And I'll turn that over to Sam Laforte, our cannabis licensing manager. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Cummings and board members. I'm Sam Laforte, cannabis licensing office manager. I'm here to provide the board options for considering cannabis canopy increases in line with prior board direction. PowerPoint issue, hold on. In November, the board considered cultivation issues in light of sustainable growth, economic development, and responsible regulations to seek alignment with the sustainability plan updates provided by the planning division. Uh, this spurred a robust discussion at the board that led to directing staff to seek community input on these potential program changes. On June 4th, staff provided the board a report on the public outreach. Uh, the board had a thorough discussion of these results and directed staff uh, to draft ordinances related to the November board memo. Uh, this item is limited to the cultivation related aspects of that board direction, which include uh, removal of co-location requirements, allowing the full use of greenhouses in the CA zone and expanding canopy allocations. Uh, staff is here to present two options for the board, and both options presented retain the environmental protections and setbacks within existing code. Um, both of them include the removal of the co-location requirements and allow for full uses of greenhouses within the CA zone. Uh, for context, we currently calculate allowable canopy um, based on the percentage of parcel size while limiting total canopy based on zone district. And um, these, both of these options have canopy limits that are based on site parcel size alone. Um, option one is noted in exhibit one of the board packet and it reflects the 2% annual canopy increases. Um, this follows the board direction from June um, and it's only applicable for operators who remain in good standing with the county and are not subject to complaints. Uh, staff recommends limiting this expansion to the CA, TP, and SU zone districts. And option two, um, which is noted in exhibit two, um, this is staff's recommendation, which is for allowing a one-time expansion of canopy. Um, that's a 10% expansion in the CA zone district and 8.75% expansion in the SU and TP zone districts. Similar to option one, this would only be uh, applicable to operators who remain in good standing and are not subject to complaints. Uh, to provide some context for the board, um, CEQA analysis will be required for um, all operators under option one annually uh, for every 2% canopy increase, where for option two, CEQA analysis will only be required one time. Um, some of the functional differences are the 2% will allow a marginal year-over-year -year growth potential, where the 10% um, allows increased adaptability 
based on market demands for operators. And with option one, um, state licenses will have to be amended annually, where option two, state licenses would only have to be amended one time. And those state license amendments, um, they cost the cultivators money, but more importantly, they take a significant amount of time to process at the state level. We're seeing times currently between three and eight months for license amendments. And those would be based on the CEQA um, evaluations that the department would have to provide. Now, these changes will have a financial impact to the CLO because we are likely to see a decrease in licenses associated with the removal of the co-location requirements. Um, staff will likely need to seek changes to the unified fee schedule um, if the board pursues either option. And I'm happy to answer any questions uh, the board may have on the proposed options. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I'll open it up to members of the public to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item today. If so, you can please step forward on the mic and you'll have two minutes. Hey, greetings. Uh, Darren Story. Um, I'm one of the licensees in South County. We strongly support option two. Um, personally, we're not looking to expand canopy. Uh, we're where we need to be right now. We're right sized. Um, but we do have co-locations, master plans, all kinds of paperwork. And I think it would greatly reduce paperwork and costs to the licensing office and the licensees if we reduce, um, if we just choose option two. Um, and like Sam alluded to, it, it might reduce fees. So as we're also working in San Benito, we're, we're recommending to have a fee, a license fee structure based on square footage or, or canopy so that it's fair and equitable. Um, we actually don't really mind the license fees right now. They, they work for us. Um, but with state licensing and um, acquiring all the, working with the master plan and all the co-location, it really does create extra paperwork and administrative burden. Um, like I said, I don't expect a whole lot of licensees to expand just based on market conditions right now. Um, but I think it would reduce paperwork. Uh, thanks a lot. Hello, my name is uh, Jacob Farrar, and I also um, work in South County at a cannabis facility. And I would definitely um, go with option two. Option one seems like it's um, an administrative burden that is not only difficult for the county to work with, but also because of um, the requirements that are necessary to change our maps on an annual basis. Um, we had the problem this year where the state didn't respond to our licensing uh, request to change. We had to change from a small license to a medium license, and they didn't approve it in time to in order to get the crop in. So that was a major problem. Um, cannabis is now the the experiment of this um, has run its course, and the it's a commodity now, an agricultural commodity. So we just want to be able to to farm our acreage um, compared to other farmers in the community. Um, we're accepted by our neighbors, and um, we're good operators. And this gives us a chance to to farm the full allocation uh, and the full acreage, farmable acreage that that we could, rather than being limited to just a small bite of acreage. Comparing this with um, you know the the fairs coming up, and my wife is making a Dutch apple pie for that, and you can imagine a big pie. And two and a half percent is just a little taste of that pie. So getting us up to 15% um, would help us immensely. So I'm, I'm appreciative of Sam for bringing this forward. And it's time to make a change for the better. Thank you. Hello. Uh Jeff Nordahl, thank you guys for considering this item. And uh, I just wanted to stress that uh, for us, our farm, we have a Boulder Creek farm and uh, one in Soquel. 
and we're on SU and TP, which is very limited in canopy space right now to 10,000 square feet. And for us, this expansion, it doesn't mean higher yield and mox maximizing creating a mega farm. For us, uh, our wheelhouse is really in innovation and R&D, and we do a lot of genetics work and growing rare uh, varieties of cannabis uh, to find rare uh, comp compounds, cannabinoids, terpenes, and that requires space. So right now, um, with our current canopy size just at 10,000, we pretty much need to utilize all that space. And by the way, 10,000 square feet, that's less than a quarter acre. And we're on 52 acres and another uh, parcel, it's 250 acres. So it's just a tiny little fragment. We have absolutely zero complaints from any of our neighbors, uh, never have. Uh, so if we were able to expand that canopy, we'd probably grow the exact same amount of production canopy, but this would allow us to expand out into innovation where we're starting to do R&D. We could actually do a more robust with our R&D programs. Once we analyze those plants, we usually donate those to medical patients as well. So it just gives us a lot more flexibility, agility. And in Santa Cruz, kind of our wheelhouse is innovation, not just production. Um, and then if we do uh, hospitality, which we'd like to do in the future, it also allows us to provide a more robust and interesting garden. So if we have visitors, we want to be able to show them as many unique varieties of cannabis as possible. Uh, so more space is always better. And by the way, one of the graphics that was on here was from our farm. So if you saw that one plant sitting there with a bunch of open space, that's how we grow. It's not row cropping and maximizing yield. So um, more canopy space would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, Becky Steinbrunner. I attended some of those public uh, meetings and it was a real eye-opener for me to hear both sides of everything. So I think whatever you do, it has to support those local growers and to discourage the cartels. That's been a problem. And so in to comport with Supervisor Friend's earlier comment about how expensive paperwork is and reports are, apply that to these folks. Um, and so it seems that option two would be the best. You've heard that from the, the people here. And when I hear that they have to do a CEQA analysis, it's quite amazing to hear that nearly every housing development in the county is CEQA exempt. So I would like to propose that after the initial work that these people do, that your board make it available to them to have some way to be CEQA exempt. If there have been no problems with drainage, if there have been no complaints from neighbors, um, allow them that favor as you do other developers. I'm very worried about the cartels. And so I think that um, allowing pe the, the good actors to have some waivers on things if there are no complaints from neighbors. And that's the critical piece here, isn't it? You've heard people in the neighborhoods from Coralitos complaining about generators, traffic problems. So give the people that chance to really weigh in and make a difference here. If there are no complaints, then um, reward and incentivize the good actors here. I'm a little upset, a little concerned about these. Uh, I'm really We have speakers online, Chair. Okay. Tim, your microphone's now available. Cool. Thank you again. Um, yeah, I'm very supportive of all the things that the folks are saying here. And uh, just want to let you know, also, uh, you know, it applies to the previous item that, that everyone was speaking about. Um, when money is thin, 
ripping each other apart over processes and reporting and whatnot, uh, that, that just makes things worse. So, you know, anything that would help out these cannabis growers that are legitimate and everything to compete back against the cartels and so on, it, it all makes sense to me. And, uh, you know, for this item and the previous item, and, uh, you know, I, I like to see things simplified and for money to be used to fully help people as opposed to having huge paperwork processes that undermine everyone's efforts. So, so I just wanted to say that. And, uh, and, and uh, also I wanted to say, I really appreciate your comments earlier, Justin coming. So, so that was uh, excellent speaking on the, the previous item. Anyways, you folks have a fine, fine day. Thank you so much. John, your microphone's now available. John, if you're speaking, we're unable to hear you. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next speaker. We'll circle back to see if John's able to connect. Aziz, your microphone's now available. Hi, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Um, Aziz here, um, licensee in South County. Um, I'm calling in today to support option two. Um, as Sam said, uh, anyone who is has complaints or bad actors um, are not eligible for these canopy increases. So this really incentivizes people to get along with their neighbors and make sure their neighbors aren't bothered by their operations. And I think this would be uh, overall benefit for the county. Um, it would increase jobs. It would increase revenue. It would, it would be great for everybody. Um, so thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions, comments, and uh, action. I'll start with, actually, I'll start down here with Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. LaForty, for making a really in-depth study of this and the options that are available. And all, since the day we really uh, passed the cannabis orders, we've been working to adjust them based on uh, input from growers and retailers, as well as the enforcement and the neighbors and so forth. And to say that this has been a work in progress is really an understatement. Uh, I appreciate all of the efforts of the staff and the community uh, to make this ordinance make sense or better sense, possibly, and I continue to support those who want to make a living from this. Um, and likewise, I appreciate the work that went into evaluating the proposals, as I said. from, uh, But I don't think allowing this kind of cannabis growth is going to substantially make the local industry that much more successful. Um, and because of the potential impacts on uh, neighboring properties and what might happen in the future, I'm more comfortable in keeping the limits to where they are in terms of canopy size at this point. But again, I appreciate the, the staff uh, presenting the options that uh, you did today. Thank you. Yep. Supervisor Hernandez. So I think some of the folks brought it up about efficiency and streamlining. But I think it's important if, that, you know, for the cult, it's both for our cultivators and also our staff to, um, to support uh, option two. Uh, I'd still like to see, you know, a year report or unless something comes up, you know, that urgent matter that comes up, a six month report. But I think that, you know, um, my, my only question is uh, I had the opportunity to attend, briefly attend the online and then the one in South County, the listening tour. Uh, I think most of the people there are mostly in favor. There was a group that was not really supportive. I wanted to see if those kinds of the, their issues were addressed, the questions that they brought up in that listening tour, in this report. Um, one of the main concerns expressed on the cultivation-related aspects um, were people on on any side of this thought the co-location requirements were an administrative issue, an administrative burden, and most people didn't have many contributions uh, in regards to the greenhouse allocation piece. 
Um, when it came to canopy expansion, um, there was not much in terms of uh, negative comments that, that we observed and heard from people. People were very concerned with uh, potential conflicts with residential uses. And um, there was questions about uh, how those things could occur, how residential conflicts could occur. And the language that we put in um, to support good actors, essentially, people who are not subject to complaints, um, people who uh, remain in good standing with the county, right? So they, they still have to apply or comply with all of the county rules, all the state regulations. They'll still be um, inspected by the county four times a year and likely by the state at least once. Um, though that's really all we could do to try to... Um, achieve the goals of, of expanding canopy while addressing community concerns. So, um, you know, our setbacks, our environmental regulations, they're all still there. And in all likelihood, many of our cultivation sites in the county wouldn't be able to maximize these setbacks. Um, we or these canopy expansions. Um, so I believe that's the best way I can address that question. Yeah, that was good. Um, so, you know, I, I'm in the spirit of our last item, you know, the housing report, I'm supportive of option two um, for the sake of streamlining and efficiency for both our staff and the cultivators. Supervisor Connick. Uh, thank you. Could you just um, describe in a little bit more detail the cost of doing the annual CEQA analysis? Both for us as well as for cultivators applying for the increase. So um, CEQA analysis on sites currently takes around 12 hours on average. Um, so that would we'd likely see about a 20% decrease to that average um, because we're talking about an expansion. Uh, but the analysis still has to occur. We still have to go out to the site. site. We have to ground truth what the cultivators are putting on paper. Um, so we estimate this will likely take between 90 and 135 days of staff time a year. Um, and staff is currently two, we have two full-time staff and one part-time staff. Um, you know, I work about 260 days a year on average, and I do all the CEQA analysis. So this would be my bird. Got it. So, so it is. And, and we bill um, the, the cultivators um, based on our time for this. So uh, we do charge for these services to make the CEQA determinations and filings. So what would the cost then be of uh, updated CEQA analysis? Um, likely in the magnitude of uh, two to $4,000 okay. per site. If there are, if there's the potential to do a, a, a notice of exception of exemption, um, but depending on mm -hmm. what the expansion is, that could change dramatically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate the, you know, comments and uh, wanting greater efficiency. My concern is that we're going from, um, you know, even after the co-location, you know, 5% uh, of a commercial ag parcel to 15% uh, of the parcel. So basically a tripling in size um, after one year of operation. I mean, the idea behind a 2% per year was sort of like demonstrating that um, the cultivator would be a good neighbor and could handle that increased size. And so this is, a, I mean, I get it still 15%, but still a, a pretty significant change in the ordinance. Um, I mean, I, I feel more comfortable if it was after more than just one year of operation, um, or maybe it's two uh, different considerations of 5% each or something along those lines. And obviously this is gonna have to go to the planning commission. It'll be discussed a lot further, but um, just my initial thoughts. Supervisor Fred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the comments about um, the paperwork burden information as well. That was helpful. Um, I, I will just make a, sort of a broad comment then I have a question. The broad comment is I believe that the board direction at the two previous discussions was to include the economic analysis with the cultivation increase as well. I mean, I, I believe that because I'd asked for it. So I was intending to have that come as part of this, that we would actually know. Um, I mean, there's a fine fiscal impact to the county, which is real. And I know that you'll come back during, I mean, that's fine. But 
the question that had been asked and what I had intended to lease the meeting remotely that was in Aptos that was asked by some of the neighbors was, um, can you point to other counties or other areas? Because um, the original board letter that come from my two colleagues had said that this would increase, this is part of what they were arguing for, but this would increase sales tax to the county or this would impact, uh, this would increase, you know, um, this would bring additional funds into the county and that it would improve viability. And so I just wanted to, I mean, just I just wanted somebody to prove that to me. I just wanted some some cross data, and, and that was in the original board direction. That was in the follow up comments that were made, and it's not in today's document. And, and I recognize that you say that it's going to come in the second portion, but this was supposed to be part of the whole package. And so I just wanted to say that that I feel as though again the board's voting on something without uh, the totality of information. But that's that's a comment that is sort of where it is. The second thing is is a question that I just want clarity on because I'm a little confused on if we eliminate the greenhouse canopy limit, is it still 15% of, so which one of the two sort of dominates on, on the size? Let's say you've got a CA parcel in my district. I mean, basically all these things are in my district, right? For example, I have a CA parcel in my district that has 1.4 million square feet of greenhouse space. Um, and I'm sure you know which one it is. So are we saying that 1.4 million square feet of canopy can grow at that location if it's not more than 15% of the total parcel size or how, how are those two things connected? So supervisor friend, you, you were here during the original, um, ordinance drafting and uh, large parcels with greenhouses, uh, large meaning greater than 10 acres in size, uh, they were grandfathered in to be allowed to utilize the entire square footage of the greenhouse space back in 2018. Okay. So this change would not impact those parcels that are greater than 10 acres in size. This change would only impact parcels that are less than 10 acres in size within the CA zone district. Okay. And then if, so uh, let's say then you have a nine acre parcel, although you mentioned a couple that were small, let's say the four or five acre one that you had in the is it the entirety, if that's more than 15 per, is it, where's the 15% come? Is it only for an outdoor grow? I mean, I just want to make sure that there's clarity on that. Okay. The, yes. It's, okay. It's, it's only for, for outdoor. So then do we have a sense then from a total square footage? I mean, although I, I understand what, what Darren was saying, and I, and I think it's probably true that there really aren't going to be very many people taking advantage of this and that there's been a consolidation in the industry, but I just want to know what's possible. Cause when we're talking about a SQL analysis, we, we tend to, you actually analyze toward the most um, the greatest impact. Um, what is the total square footage of increase possible then in greenhouses that this would allow for? There's currently one greenhouse uh, in the CA zone that has a cannabis license that is less than 10 acres in size. Okay. So that increase would approximately be about 8,000 square feet of canopy. Okay. All right. Uh, I appreciate it. The, the economic analysis, I mean, I recognize it's going to come in the second part, but um, again, that was my understanding that that we were trying to find out what additional revenue this would bring to the county on a canopy size increase. I recognize we bifurcated elements of it, and that makes it a little bit complicated, but, but the discussion was any changes we're making to the ordinance should be justified with additional information, or not justified, they should be backed up, and then the board can make a decision whether they care or not um, about the the economic impact. So it would have been nice. Um, I'm just saying to have that information this time too. I can address it to nope. some extent if you'd Please, like. Yeah. Um, so there would be no change to sales tax um, going down this pathway. Um, the sale of cannabis goods is a business to business sale. Um, sales tax is only uh, generated based on retail sales. So we've never generated any sales tax from um, the non-retail cannabis sector within our county. Um, in terms of bringing additional funds to cultivators, that would be limited to those cultivators who do choose to expand. Um, and the actual intake of funds to the county would be based solely on CBT revenues. Mm -hmm. And we've seen um, the CBT revenues, generally speaking, uh, for both retail and non-retail, stay consistent over the past couple of years and i do not expect or or predict there to be a change in that based on our current tax structure and i'm happy to provide more context and details to you um outside of this meeting but if i go down that rabbit hole it's it's hard to come back out of it i respect that but i that that top line was very helpful and i appreciate that so far 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, first off, thanks for the presentation for being able to go out. And I think in particular, um, I'm just really grateful for uh, the effort to go and do the community listening sessions and get community feedback and make sure the community was aware of the decisions that are being made here today. Um, and I also appreciate the questions that have been brought up by my colleagues um, because it helps better understand the economic um, outcomes if we move forward with this today. Um, personally, I think that it's really important that we're, some, we're supporting our cultivators in our community. Um, the cannabis industry took a huge blow when we, which is a good thing going towards legalization, but at the same time, you know, a lot of larger corporate companies went into communities and really destroyed the small businesses that really, you know, helped um, with cannabis in those communities initially. And so to the extent that we can continue to support those, um, those small businesses that were able to survive um, that kind of um, corporate takeover of cannabis throughout the state of California, I think is really important. And so um, I'm supportive of option two and moving forward and seeing how um, this goes. And then if it's, I mean, I think the one thing that's really critical to also, um, you know, the point to raise is that, you know, we've only heard support here today. We haven't had any people, any opposition come out. And that's after alerting the community that this is going to come forward. And I think that um, moving forward with option two today will allow this to go to the planning commission, which is an opportunity for the community to weigh in further. And then it's going to come back to us for adoption. So today we're not adopting option one. We're directing staff to move forward with that and to get further input from the community or planning commission. And I think that that um, is a good opportunity for us to be able to hear more. And it sounds like we'll get some more of that economic information back before we make a final decision. And so um, I think that, you know, it seems like a good process in terms of that ability for us to move forward. I did have one question as it relates to CEQA, and maybe I missed this. Are we, is the, the county, is the county conducting annual CEQA analysis? No, CEQA analysis is required for every operator at the time um, a business license is applied for. So we can't approve anyone without doing CEQA analysis. And the state also requires that that CEQA analysis be provided to them prior to them approving for any licensee. So if, for example, one of the operators wanted to expand their operations, they would then need to get into CEQA analysis for that expansion. And if they wanted to expand even further, they'd have to get conducted. Yes. The CEQA analysis. yes, that's great. Cause I was, I heard annual CEQA analysis and I was going to say that's ridiculous if, we, if that was a requirement. Well, annual CEQA analysis would be required to do a 2% annual canopy bonus. Okay. And if we do a one time, which um, for context, uh, what staff recommended is basically equivalent to five years right. worth of 2% expansion, except slightly smaller in the SU and TP zone districts because those sites, uh, those particular parcels have um, much more environmental restrictions associated with them and likely will not be able to expand very much at all. Um, for one of the parcels that was mentioned today, 250 acres, um, they're limited to 30,000 square feet currently in the TP zone because there are three parcels. Um, based on some GIS analysis of that parcel, we predict their canopy to max out at approximately 60, 65,000 square feet. So they would just about double to an acre and a half on 250 acre parcel. Um, yeah. And many of our SU parcels, there's two of them that would be impacted by this. Um, we suspect expansion of less than 5,000 square feet on both. Okay, thank you. And I guess the final point is, that was brought up is that, you know, people are gonna, one, this is for people who are good actors. Um, and the other point of it too, is that not everybody's gonna wanna opt in. And so I think it's worth us seeing how this plays out. And so I'll finish my comments there and then look to my colleagues for um, a motion on this item or any further comments or questions, so. So I, I'll move the recommendation for uh, staff recommendation for option two to consider cannabis cultivation canopy expansions. There's, it looks like there's three. Uh, there's three action items on here. So, and all three as well. Yeah. It was so. The motion is direct staff to move forward with option two for the expansion of the canopy allocation based on previous board direction. Schedule the selected option for review by the Planning Commission and direct staff to return on or before December 10, 2024 with the scheduled public hearing to consider amendments to Santa Cruz County Section 13.10.650. Is that, 
That's the motion. That's the motion. Okay. Oops. Um, uh, I'd be willing to second if uh, the maker of the motion be willing to consider a friendly amendment that we consider the uh, canopy expansions after the third year of operations rather than after the first year of operations. So that's something that three years after elapsed rather than just one. I'm just concerned that, um, you know, someone can, anyone can behave for one year. Um, not to mention, I think that most of our current operators have, or cultivators have been operating for probably that long already. And so, you know, I, this is really more to your point about the corporate takeover of cannabis, sort of preventing someone from moving into our market relatively quickly and maybe acting a little bit brash. You said three? Three years. Yeah. Would you be willing to compromise on two? <laughs> um, so basically after two years of operation, then in the third year, someone could apply for an expansion. Sure. Okay. So is that a second and a? Yes. Yeah. I, I think. Amendment. And a friendly amendment. Okay. So it sounds like the friendly amendment is to. Um, after two years of operation, then, then a grower could expand their footprint. Yeah. So, any further questions or comments on this item? Supervisor Friend. Oh, okay. Um, seeing none, we'll go to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. No. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. No. And Cummings. Aye. That passes with Supervisors Cummings, Hernandez, and Koenig voting in favor, Supervisor McPherson and Friend voting in the opposition. Okay, with that, I want to thank everybody for their time. This item will be heard by the Planning Commission. It will come back to the board, um, I believe, in November. And so just want to thank you all for your time today. And we will see you at the next meeting. It's not even three yet.